safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Another gorgeous sunrise down here in South Africa. Isn't that just stunning? Well, I hope you're ready for this virtual safari because jump on board, get all your things, and let's go on CGTN's digital safari. There it is, the sun peeking through on that wonderful tree. Everything is still a little bit brown and dry, but that will change very, very quickly. Hello, everybody. Hope that you're well. My name is Trishal, and I have Theo. I'm uh, this wonderful morning down in the Sabi Sands at Juma Game Reserve. We're in the western section, Kruger Park, just outside the puck. And we are very excited. I think that we're going to actually head off to the hyena den and see what's happening there. But let us enjoy the wonderful sunrise. Already pretty high up as the days are starting to get a little bit longer. Now remember we're coming to you from several locations across Africa, up in the Masai Mara and down here in South Africa as well. And this is happening live on CGTN's Digital Safari, absolutely live right now. So you can chat to us using that hashtag CGTNWild or of course the hashtag WildEarth. We can talk about the sun and the trees and how it's starting to warm up. This morning it's 14 degrees Celsius or 57 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very comfortable for me. So like I said, we want to head down to the den. Hopefully it'll be active. And also I know that there's a lepidus that hangs around in that area. So maybe we'll get lucky. Very cool. Oh, no, there it goes. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to and beyond Pinna Private Game Reserve. My name is Devolt and behind the camera we've got Craig. <laughs> Sorry about that. We just had a tawny eagle sit on the tree in front of us and literally as you came to us, he flew off, I think. Um, he's probably starting to fly around because it's starting to, to heat up a little bit. But uh, I think we are going to keep on carrying on into this area in front of us. And we uh, also have to go kind of towards the area where Matt um, just a couple of days ago had a couple of lions um, inside a big dried out watering hole. And that's why we're heading. So that Tawny was actually sitting in this tree and I think he was roosting the whole evening in this tree. It's not uncommon for them to roost in their territory, maybe not too far away from where their nests are. And it, uh, by the looks of it, when I, we got to get a nice view of it, it didn't look like it was a young bird, so an adult that was just uh, resting here. <laughs> Look at... I think uh, we are going to keep on going after this tawny has left us and see if we can maybe track down some other animals. Jumbo Jumbo and hello, hello everybody and welcome to the Maasai Mara of Kenya where we got a clan of hyenas feasting on a wildebeest for breakfast. Just first listen to all what's going on on that table as they're fighting for bits and pieces of that zebra. When I got here, there were three hyenas. Now I think I'm counting almost seven. And from a distance, I can see more of them are still coming 
a very good morning to everybody from the Masimar of Kenya. My name is David, and with me on camera this morning is Bungay. Bungay, how are you, sir? And we're very excited and very lucky to start our day with hyenas devouring uh, this zebra. The first thing I'm trying to do is to find out who brought down this zebra. Is it other predators or is it the hyenas themselves? Just look at their behavior because they have a particular picking order on who eats first, who comes next, and who is third. Another cold morning of Masimara, 16 degrees Celsius, 6 to 1 degrees Fahrenheit. And ladies and gentlemen, remember we are live and should you have any questions or comments, you're more than welcome to ask us. And as usual, you can use hashtags World Earth or hashtag CGTN World. The closest territory I am from where, from where we are now, it should be a clan that we call the North Clan. It's one of the largest clans or groups of hyenas in the Masai Mara. My guess is this clan uh, should be coming from there. All these hyenas here who are devouring uh, this zebra would be coming from there. I want to investigate the actual place where this zebra was brought down and I'll be able to know who actually uh, killed it. Is it these hyenas or other predators like lions? And maybe the hyenas came and pushed the lions out. Okay, well, literally drive off in uh, just a little bit down the road and i'm sure you all saw this eagle just fly off and we we found him just quiet so and off a bit there trying to rearrange his feathers get some loose feathers and maybe some dirt and so out and i don't know if you saw that small bird flying past there so those were something that were actually a little bit. And uh, yeah, this is a big, big, uh, tawny eagle. Now. I'm, I'm keeping quiet for you to listen to that. Now, we got, if I'm not wrong, another 20 hyenas that are just landing in here in this particular sighting where they're going to celebrate uh, eating uh, this uh, zebra. Earlier, Alon, I told you I'm going to find out who could have brought this zebra down, but my guess is the hyenas did the job themselves. So when you hear me not talking, it's just because I want you to get the audio or the calls from these hyenas as they try to push and shove on the dining table. Look on their heads. Some of them are full of blood, and to me, that shows a bit of dominance. And chances are, this could be the females, because in the hyenas' kingdom, the females are always more dominant and more in charge than the males. Sorry for those of you who could be a bit sensitive and think this could be a bit graphic, but this is how things play out here in the African wilderness. Everything happens for a reason and for a good cause. Very sad for the zebra, but you'd all imagine these hyenas need to continue living. So when you come in the Masimara, for example, in the months of June, July, and August, uh, September, sometimes going to October, we'll have a lot of these happenings. We'll have hyenas bringing down zebras, lions bringing down wildebeest, and that's exactly what we call the migration, where we are going to learn more about the same. 
From the southern plains of the Serengeti, over a million grazers move northwest through the Western Corridor, gathering along the banks of the Grumeti River. Once the chaos of the rut comes to an end, the herds gallop north once again. In time, more than two million animals amount to feast on the abundance the Mara has to offer. But the reward of the red oat grass does not come easy. The zebra vanguard is the first on the banks, taking the plunge into the treacherous Mara River in order to reach the untouched long grass plains on the other side. Not only must they face the turbulent waters, but also the crocodiles gliding through the rapids in anticipation. Then comes the body of the migration, the thundering herds of the white-bearded wildebeest, with their bleeds echoing through the landscape while in search for greener pastures. Hunger, so too are the lions of the Mara, who patrol the banks of the river. The risks are known, but the herds are determined. All must make the leap. Some will fall, but for the survivors, the lush greenery that awaits is bountiful. And then, as is nature's way, it comes the time to cross the river again as they continue to follow the life-giving storms and nourishing plains. Well, every year, that is always the highlight of the migration in the Maasai Mara, seeing the thousands or the hundreds rather of wildebeest or zebras trying to cross the Mara River from one side to the other. Not all that make it because from where I am, I'm very close to the river. I'm just about 100 meters away from the river. We've got these hyenas that are feeding here and to my left, about 100 yards from here is where the Mara River is. Possibly, possibly, maybe those are crossing this morning and when this uh, zebra were crossing coming this side, maybe one of them fractured his foot and it went limping and these hyenas are very sharp and they saw it and they thought they take advantage of that as a target. That could be a possibility. But also, don't forget, Hyenas are very good hunters. And you can see the discipline on the dining table there that will just allow you to hear all the cackling and the giggling and all the noises they're making. Anybody who is subordinate is not allowed to eat. The seniors, the dominant females that are high in the hierarchy will always eat first. Every other minute I'm getting more convinced is that these hyenas brought down uh, this zebra here. We'll just keep waiting here and enjoying uh, the party from a distance. Good morning from Prydens, where we have also got some hyena, but it's slightly more relaxed than all the commotion that is going on in the Mara with David. But it sounds really exciting. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Sebastian Rombi. Like I said, we are here in South Africa on a reserve that's part of the Greater Kruger. Now, the one hyena sleeping in front of us, and we've got another hyena just over a little bit over there who is denning at the moment, but it was really exciting last night because all the hyenas were going crazy. I don't think you'll see the den, unfortunately. We'll have to look at the hyena up in front. Um, they were definitely interacting with a predator because I could hear some rumbles coming back from a species that was not a hyena. And with the amount of commotion, I suspect it was probably a lion um, because with a leopard, they would have just chased it straight off of its kill and there wouldn't have been any problems. So I'm sure that the hyenas of Pridelands are quite tired. <laughs> this one is just laying on the road trying to absorb some of the warmth and hopefully catch some of the morning rays as they filter through the trees. But very, very interesting, um, the dynamics here at Pridelands with the hyenas. And I look forward to just well, still trying to figure them out. It's quite difficult because we haven't seen them on a big kill like you've seen with David, where we can see how the hyenas are feeding and figure out who is higher ranking than the others. So we have also been looking to go to the right near Treehouse Dam, which is way on our way. Have 
some elephants having a drink and or one slightly confused buffalo who was actually moving wood and came down and drank with the herd. The ones that were drinking got a fright when the buffalo came down but seemed to, to be quite used to it. I wonder if it had been following the herd for some time. Just enjoy the scenery. sound a big cow coming through. Oh, little one trying to make it up there. <laughs> oh, big girl I love seeing them climb up. Oh, she almost splashed me. I just love we can actually just enjoy the scenery, the sounds of the water, watch all of the clumsy, especially these little ones, look at them come through. <laughs> now, I'm going to go around to the safe side, mum. I always tell you it's about timing our chair and be happier that just thought to say let's stop at Treehouse Dam on our way into the hyena and we get this marvelous sighting. Now I'd like for you to listen sounds and just watch in peace look at these two walking together oh is that not sweet no aggressive behavior to that buffalo that is special very special now guys, remember, we're having a bit of a like, silent moment here, watching them, right, the quiet moment, but do send us your questions and send through comments using the hashtag Wild Earth or the tag CGTN Wild or the YouTube chat stream use at FC.
scavengers, but apparently to me, hyenas are very good and successful hunters comparing them to the other predators. Chuck, how much nutrition do these hyenas get from the bones? Chuck, I've seen many, many a times the hyenas go into the bones more sometimes than the meat. And my experience is, I want to believe, bones are full of phosphorus and calcium and maybe other minerals. When situations are very dire and there's not much for them to eat as in fresh meat, I've seen hyenas getting very hard pieces of bones or skulls and you'll see them trying to chew them and hyenas chuck will almost break down everything they get uh, from any carcasses the only thing i haven't seen hyenas succeeding in breaking down from a carcass uh, may be the teeth but any other bone they break it down for the minerals and i think most of them they know they're very high in minerals like calcium and phosphorus Two of them have been very dominant here, but I think it could be like the lead female who has been eating. And if you look carefully at uh, that poor zebra, not much is left. And again, as I said, for the sensitive uh, viewers, do not worry. This is how things uh, work out here in the African uh, wilderness. I'll continue being here for a couple more minutes and see whether we'll get more hyenas coming in. Found a small crash of rhinos and you can see they've got a bit of an entourage as well. So we've got them white rhinos here. What seems, oh, there you can see in calf and its mom there in the back. And then these two big ones that's here in front of us actually look like two bulls. And Craig and I were just talking now and uh, wondering like why these two bulls are together. Because they actually look fairly big. And uh, what we think is that they are probably not dominant bulls yet. It doesn't seem like they've got scrapes on their faces or anything like that from fighting. So they're probably just hanging around here, hoping that this female goes into estrus or not without the dominant bull of the area even realizing. You can see there's a, there's a few birds flying around them. I think there's some forktail drongos and also saw a red belt ox picker on them a little bit earlier. Look at this bull, his head is down, just feeding away in this cool morning air. And uh, how you can see is a bull is even if they're the youngster and mom's coming out in the back there. Sorry, just to get back, if the female comes out there, you'll see that the muscles behind the neck of the bulls are quite, quite big. Look at that uh, big muscle behind his head there, are oh, used for fighting and so. Look at their heads moving up and down as they're feeding on the grass here. And that youngster just sticking close to mom there in the back. <laughs> so looking at the size of this youngster, he is probably around a year, year and a half old or so. And uh, his mom might be gone, going into estrus pretty soon if she hasn't already. And that's probably why these bulls are hanging around. Look at there's actually a forktail drongo that's closer to them. Oh, the one just flew across the screen there as well. And you can see this one bull is actually getting pretty close to us as well. We've been creeping closer every now and then, but they are still listening to us. Look at the youngster also moving off a little bit. Look at that uh, forktail drongo that just flew off and see how he hovered around the rhino there. So I wonder if there was maybe some insect or something like that that got um, got chased out of the grass by these rhinos and then he was hovering around, grabbed it and went back to his little perch there. And that's what you call hawking, he was hawking the insects. These rhinos are feeding away from us right now and the road actually goes around to the front of them. So I think we are going to stick around and see what they get up to, maybe see if we can get in front of them. Well, I have 
have not to say because the hyenas are much louder than me. I'm keeping quiet for some time. I have always believed that the animals have the right of way, so they also have the right to talk and to communicate because it's for their own good. And I want to believe the brothers or the sisters or the cousins here are calling their relatives to come and join them for this uh, beautiful breakfast of the zebra. Now, when it comes to scavenging here in the African wilderness, we'll have hyenas. We also got other scavengers uh, like vultures or marabou stocks. And if you look carefully there, we got some two huge birds on top of that tree. Those are vultures, or sometimes we also call them scavengers, or rather they're scavengers and they're vultures. What they're trying to do, they'll have to wait until these hyenas are out of here, then they'll fly down and start feeding. Well, you notice their necks are tucked in because it's still rather chilly here in the Masai Mara. And once these hyenas leave, you'll see them fly down here. Now, I was talking about hyenas using their sense of the smell to pick up any uh, prey from a distance that's dead, but the vultures use more of sight than anything else. Now, for currently there are two, but as it warms up, we'll get them using thermos to rise in the air to have some good uh, visuals of what's happening on the ground. Not forgetting there's some egrets there uh, that are just equally white, but the, I mean equally beautiful, but they got nothing to do uh, with the kill. And I think in that particular tree we got uh, egrets, some herons, and that could be some breeding ground for them. You see that tree have so many branches, uh, some of them that are white from the droppings or uh, I would guess from those buds. Still a bit chilly for them. So as it warms up, they'll be leaving that area maybe to go out and start feeding. We've got one hyena that's carrying some uh, internal organs right there. Thank you, Bungay. Bungage the gentleman with the camera. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, should you have any comments on what we're showing you or any questions, you're more than welcome to uh, send comment or ask us questions. And as I told you, you can tweet using CGTN, hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Kingola, very correct. These are the spotted hyenas. We've got about three species of hyenas in Africa. We've got the striped hyenas, spotted hyenas, and the brown hyenas. This particular one here, we call them spotted hyenas. We have had other people sometimes calling them the laughing hyenas because of how they communicate and like they are laughing, especially more in the night than during the day. Ginola, I'm not sure that call that's laughing. That one particular call basically is to call the other members to come and join. It's always, they're always very vocal and that one counts. When you look at all the different calls they make, that particular one is always to reach the members, wherever they are in the den, please come and join us. They know they would face other competition for example uh, lions may come in here so they would want to call one of oh you know one of their own or their own member cl clans to come and eat before maybe other predators like lions maybe come and push them out again i'm not going anywhere because this is looking exciting and i'm staying put right here <laughs> And here is another scavenger, right back to Vulture. And which makes it very easy for it to fly off. You'll often see vultures on dead trees, and I guess it just adds to the whole idea that many people have about them. This kind of dark sense about a vulture somehow 
associated with death. But in fact, all they're doing is taking up a niche that is not filled by other creatures. They're scavengers, scavenging bird. So they end up at carcasses where things are obviously dead. And they need a nice big dead tree to perch on because they have a large wingspans of about two meters larger. And if they're in a tree that's fully green with lots of little branches, they won't be able to take off very efficiently. So they hang around dead trees and dead animals. But that's because they took advantage of a niche that other animals were not as good as take, at taking advantage of. You get other scavenging birds, of course, other vultures, bats, leer. But vultures are really, really good at it. They can get into the bits of meat. Oh, bit of a yawn from the vulture. They can get into bits of meat that that scavengers that are land mammals can't actually get to because of that beak. Our hooded vultures have a thinner beak so they can get really, really in between bits of sinew. In fact, no, they'd love some sinew, but bits of bone, they can really get in there. And this white-backed vulture with slightly You're larger, there, more robust beak can really, really pull at bits of flesh that's still attached to skin and things like that. And it's not disgusting and they're not bad. They've just taken advantage of a niche. And if you want to survive out here in the wild, you have to have a speciality, a job. Sometimes even being a generalist is a niche because everybody else is specialized. But as long as you find a way to capitalize on a behavior, on a food source, on a nesting area, whatever it is, it means that your survival is definitely increased. So we've looped around and these white runners, the bull that's there on the on the left hand side and this one that's walking away now that Craig's filming, they were at a dung in there and they all defecated and even the female went and defecated and you can see they all smelling the ground and uh, I wonder if they are testing if this female is maybe an estrus. Um, and just see they, they, these two bulls actually like not feeding, just moving around a bit. And uh, the, the mom and the youngsters kind of move off to the right hand side. See that bull there with the little bit bigger horn, how his head is down, just smelling around there. Interesting how these dung middens are used to pass on information like that. There was a bit of a standoff earlier as well. And like we said, I uh, see how that bull is like picking his head up and he's actually smelling towards the female. Like, oh, look at the youngster coming in. <laughs> Very playful. Like a uh, mock charging the little the bull there. So are they coming closer, inspecting this female? And the youngster is actually coming towards us a little bit, listening to our voices. So I would like to know from you, uh, the viewers, if you know how many different rhino species there are in, in Africa. Like I said earlier, this is these are the, the southern white rhinos. So let me know if you know how many rhino species there are and subspecies there are in Africa. Oh, look at this youngster. It seems like they 
are steadily mobile going towards a dried out watering hole to the right hand side. But look at these bulls. They keep on coming closer and closer and smelling towards her hindquarters. But she gives out a little snort every now and then. And that kind of tells them off a little bit. It'll be interesting what to see what happens in a, lo in a little bit. And Ruth, you're asking if not having a horn makes a difference when fighting. I think it definitely do, does in the, sense, in the sense of if one has a horn and the other doesn't, then the one with the horn obviously has a massive advantage and could do some, some damage to the other animals. So uh, that is why we... Uh, we remove all the horns of all the all the rhinos. This one, of the one bull, obviously hasn't been uh, the horn hasn't been trimmed for for a while. But uh, oh, look at that! Look how he's smelling there, coming to a hindquarters. Very interesting behaviour with the two bulls being so close together. But uh, yes, just getting back to your question, it definitely plays a role. But in that. Both of them have horns that have been trimmed and they're not too sharp. They, they can't really hurt each other. They might still be able to fight each other off though. But those horns are also used to protect themselves against potential predators also because even though they are so big, for example, a while ago at Ngala, there was actually hyenas that took down a youngish rhino and he was probably quite young, so didn't have too big of a horn. Maybe a bigger rhino with a bigger horn would have been able to fight them off. So interesting, these bulls coming closer and closer and inspecting this female, which tells me that she's probably going into estrus. And once she gets into estrus properly, then we might see these two bulls fighting a bit. Ah, yeah, see how they... She just turned towards them and actually ran a little bit towards the vehicle. Okay, I'm going to keep my voice nice and low. See how close they get towards us. Oh, look at that. They are literally 10 or so meters from us. I think Craig and I, I think Craig and I are so happy to be between these rhinos and we can actually, they're so close to us, we can literally hear them munching on the grass right next to us. The one bull is just about to cross the road right next to us here and the rest it seems they're all facing in that direction but you never know. They might actually stick around here for a little bit. They often move around in circles and all around this area, depending on where the nice grazing is. But I don't think these bulls are going to be moving too far away from this female, because like we say, they've been smelling around her, and um, I think they are very interested in staying, sticking around for now. Interesting how this youngster, we haven't, we've been with them for about an hour now, now and they've just kept on feeding. Oniwa, I'm assuming that you're asking how old the young rhino is. Um, the bulls that are here close to us, I would assume that they're probably around four to five years old because they seem to be big, but I don't know if they're dominant bulls yet. The female's probably well over 10 or so years. She looks fairly old, but the youngster, I don't know if you can see is him sticking out just there in front of his mom, or he's just behind his mom now. You can just see his ears. So looking at the size of him, he's probably between a year to a year and a half um, old. And the fact that he's feeding on, on grass, uh, since we've gotten here, he's been 
with his head down and feeding on grass, meaning that he's probably getting weaned from his mother's milk. So I think he's about a year and a half here. But I think we're going to sit here and enjoy these rhinos feeding around us. And uh, Craig and I will see what happens with these bulls and this female. Well, how interesting that you can look at some of these animals and know how old they could be. That one is going to stash uh, its food away somewhere. Not sure exactly where she's taking that piece of bone. For the hyenas, it could be rather difficult to estimate their age, but we look at them when they're born, they're always black and dark, and not a single of them will have spots. But as from the age of two or three months, we start seeing them having spots, and they fade, and they become lighter as they get old. And that's the only way you can have an idea of how old uh, the hyenas could be. The part here has continued and you're getting like five at a given time. At one point you're getting like 20 and then they're spreading out. Okay, yes, you're wondering how many there could be in this clan. Now, I was saying earlier, this could be the North clan. And the North clan, the last estimate we had, were about 70 strong, about 70 hyenas together. So this is the largest clan we got in this area and the strongest and the most effective. We got a few other clans. We got another clan that we call the Olorolo. We got another clan that we call the Happy Zebra. But of all the clans, this is the largest, 70 strong, and they push every other predator out if need be. The other two or three clans around here, should they make a kill, and this clan will know, they'll always get there and push them out. Lions, even five, six of them with a kill, they cannot stand this particular clan. So very matriarchal, and my guess is the two things that are feeding now are females. Beautiful light and very clever. What they're doing now first is to get the flesh. They're eating the meat first, and then they're going to deal with the bones much later. Because one, they do not want the meat to go bad. Two, and they want to make sure that it's not picked out as it's warming up. They do not get maybe other clans or, or other, I would say, other predators like lions, you know, picking the smell of this kill. So that's what they want first to conceal by eating the flesh. They know the lions or the predators will not bother with the bones and uh, ultimately they will come back to continue finishing their kill. Even if it's not today, maybe tomorrow. Most of them are well fed now and the little fights that were on that table have gone down or have died down. But you can tell there are a few more on the side that are still waiting to get some room to get there. So the three that are eating, if the ones that are, that are not eating currently are not top or do not uh, rank very highly, they will not be allowed to join the food. <laughs> and chances are after they're all fed they'll go for a drink and then back to their den just listen to how they're breaking the bones When I got here, this zebra was about three quarters, you know, from what was left. But now I think we have less than an eighth of what's left. And if they're able to split it into different parts, like a leg and a neck and the hooves, you'll see them every or each one of them will take one part and go and stash it somewhere. If you look at the one close to us, you can see it's wet on the belly, meaning that's coming from the water. And it could have taken a piece of meat, stashed there, and then came back to see whether it could get more. Then individually, they're going to eat separately on their own. The skin will not be spared either.
this has been very good stuff and what I want to do now is just to leave them enjoy their meal and I swing by the Mara River and find out if there are any sign that there could have been a crossing there earlier this morning. So today is a morning filled with spots for us because we have managed to find miners. So I told you briefly about all the commotion that we could hear from camp last night. I, it was crazy. I might even see if I can play you a recording at some point. I did try and record it from my tent. But here we go. We just popped up to the top of a crest not far from camp, just a few hundred meters, hoping um, that we would pick up on some evidence of what happened last night. And then we found a female hyena with two young cubs. But mom has gone off and the young cubs have just uh, settled down next to the road. And they look exhausted because if it was you two doing all the yapping last night, all the whooping, it was quite funny. You could hear the young hyenas from the adults all trying to um, do their bit and also, <laughs> well, sing their song. It wasn't quite singing though. It was not, it was not very pleasant. Um, but it was very, very funny to hear how high pitched uh, their voices are in comparison to the whoops of the adults. But I'm pretty sure I've seen these two before. They look like they, they've they grown uh, quite a bit. At one point there were nine hyena cubs hanging around at an active den, but uh, most of them are, you know, more than eight or nine months old. So they're not spending as much time inside the den, but rather just sleeping, you know, next to it. But I think that, that they've moved off and are joining in with the adults a little bit. Now these ones don't, don't look too big, but I would say this lot probably closer to 10 or 11 months old. So still being suckled by mom, shame, not shame, hyenas, you're lucky because you get to stay with mom and suckle for quite some time. Sometimes it extends well over a year, whereas with most of the other uh, carnivores, especially the bigger cats, it's about six or seven months, sometimes even a little bit earlier. But they do have very full bellies, so maybe they did get a, a something to eat last night. I don't see any blood or anything around their faces, but this also was many, many hours ago. This was around just before midnight that the commotion first started. You don't look very impressed. I was just saying to Sebastian, it's so nice to see that the, these two cubs are actually growing into their ears. Because it's always quite funny to see a little hyena cub when they are tiny. They start off with really small ears and then they get really big too quickly. <laughs> now they look right. Now, unfortunately, Lauren, it's been quite difficult um, to gather information on the hyenas of Prideland. So they don't have names just yet. We call them the Prideland's clan. And it, again, it's difficult to even estimate how many adults there are. We haven't seen all of them interacting at the den. Obviously, um, the lower ranking hyenas won't really be around if there are any other higher ranking hyenas. They'll sort of keep their... Uh, space and, and wait till they move off before they come in and suck all their cubs. So it's been quite difficult to tell and I also haven't seen them around a kill. When we have seen them on kills it's just been one or two individuals which I've got photos of and I've got some photos of uh, two of the females that I've seen at the den plus this new female now um, that we haven't seen the cubs just yet but we know that they're definitely inside because of her behavior and swollen mammary glands. So yeah, it's, it's quite tough here, eh? but what we really need is for them to feed on something, a big kill, like a buffalo or a giraffe, where all the members come together, and, and that will give us a, a better idea. Last night, I was so tempted to jump into a Land Rover and to drive around and see if I could find what on earth these hyenas were up to, but then I thought I have to get out of my pajamas and put long pants on and shoes, and I was just like, oh, I couldn't. It was actually, it was so freezing last night. We, we live right next to the dam on the drainage line. So it's a lot colder than everywhere else. So I didn't, but I should have. I totally should have. Next time though I hear them, I'm definitely going to go out and see what they get up to at night. They can be so, so noisy in the nighttime. And it does it able to sleep because you want to see what's happening. Now we're back at Treehouse Dam. Come and check the den, which is just behind us. And 
past the dam again, only to find more elephants coming over for a drink. Very low rumble there. Sounds of the morning. Oh, I've got some red bulled ox peckers having a drink down on the side. Hello, guys. Imagine that the big and the small using the dam at the same time. I love it. So just an update on that buffalo that we saw with this herd. I passed another guide and he told me that about four days ago he had the same herd with that young male buffalo in it, in Buffelsuk. It's to the north of us. So that buffalo has been with the herd for at least four days. I think that's too sweet. Oh, water is not good enough. We're going to have some milk too. Hello, Luke34. I hope you're well. You'd like to know how much water these elephants will drink every day. They can drink anything from 100 liters to 200 liters in one scoop of that trunk they're getting four to ten liters of water obviously depending on how much they suck up and how large they are and you think about how often they drink how many times they scoop up water in there a big bull might even take 300 liters in a day. They love water. So many coming down. Oh, and look! When we first arrived, we thought, is this the same herd? Aww. A little bit of a chase there by a youngster. So some of them did drink. Perhaps the rest of the herd has now come for a drink. Some have just walked right past. Oh, be nice to the buffalo. This buffalo must have somehow gotten separated from... That is the sound of a young calf being weaned and being denied milk from mum. A screech of note. Everybody stopped, had a listen. <laughs> I saw a little one go after the buffalo there. the slow battle. They may not have totally accepted 
to the young buffalo just yet, but he's certainly persistent, and he's certainly following them around. All right, I think off we go. We're going to keep on moving. So we've looped around and these really started to feed away from us. So there's, with the question that I asked earlier about how many um, species and subspecies of rhinos there is in Africa, so some of you said two and a lot of you said four. So all of these are correct, but so I'm assuming you said white and black rhinos, which is also is correct, but those are the two main species. So yeah, we've got some southern white rhinos. There's one more subspecies of white rhinos called northern white rhinos, which interesting enough, um, almost is almost extinct. It's very sad, but uh, Nat, Nat Geo and some other um, conservation uh, in institutions have now inseminated some northern white rhino females um, from the last male that unfortunately died not too long ago. But there is actually still five different subspecies of black rhino in Africa. Three has already gone extinct but there is believed to be about five different subspecies of black rhinos still um, walking around. So quite a few different subspecies and so of, of white rhinos. But I think um, for now we'll actually, it's easier to just say that there is uh, northern white rhino, southern white, white rhino and northern black rhino and southern black rhino because they are all so closely related and genetically very similar it is just for research purposes and because of geographically where they occur that there is different uh, species um, but you can see there's actually a little bit of a sun coming over now and uh, as the mist clouds above us are starting to burn away <laughs> see the youngsters his uh, ears are still facing straight forward and there's actually some impalas that have come across on the other side of this little rise and I think he's very inquisitive of what's going on on that side so his mom is also now listening towards where those impalas were walking earlier And now she's keeping on feeding. Obviously realize that uh, they are not a threat or anything like that. See these two bulls are just keeping their distance but keeping on feeding um, behind this female quite reluctant to leave her as we said that she's probably in the, in the early stages of her Easter cycle so they can just start smelling that she's going into estrus now and I'll try and stay with her until she's fully into estrus so that they can make some some new rhinos for us <laughs> You can just see this one bull's tail is starting to curl up, but it seems like they are still going to keep on feeding away from us. So I think we are going to keep on going and maybe go look for some other animals. We're still with a very sleepy hyena cub and sibling has got up probably to a bit more of a sunny spot on why are you sitting in the shade of the tree it's going to be a scorching day in the low felt but right now it's still quite chilly and i can't believe that it hasn't just moved just slightly to the left to get some of that morning sun because it does look a little bit cold the way that it's all huddled up like that amongst its own fluff 
but I'd quite like to figure out where the rest of the hyenas are. I suppose hyenas don't spend all that much time together. It's normally the higher ranking females and their offspring that will kind of um, stick together. And then the rest of them, I suppose, during the day, they just sort of spread out all over the show. They're very protective when another clan comes around and everybody will come together. Otherwise, you can just fight them by themselves. I don't know where these ones lie in the ranking system of the Pridelands clan, however. I'll actually have to compare my photos and just see which little ones these are and if I have a picture of them with a female. Loreen, it's quite difficult to age these hyenas just because we didn't see them from the get-go. So the nice thing about the hyenas at Juma is that you're watching them from right from almost the beginning of their life stages. So you get a more accurate um, reading of how old they are. I think that they're about 10, 11 months old, somewhere around there. So they're quite tall. They're quite fluffy. You know, normally when they get to about four months, five months old, they lose their sort of smooth coat and it starts to get a little bit fluffier. But their their legs have stretched up quite a bit. They're not as big as the adults just yet, but they're not far off. Um, either. But there they go, unfortunately. So what I thought we could do is perhaps just bumble down this road and uh, see what else we can find. There are lots of hyena tracks here. This is Saw me with my glasses on, everyone. I've had issues with my right eye, so I had to take my contacts off. But I'm going to look forward so you don't have to see the reflection in it. Now I am heading off to Chitwa, but I am having a look for. Shidulu at the same time because she's usually on this road. I'm not seeing any track. There's also some lovely birds on this road. Generally, generally. Oh, hello, squirrel. It's racing off. Somewhere on that log there. There we go. Also a good animal to watch in case they alarm at something. You can find some smaller stuff like that. Oh, that was quite a leap. The alarm at snakes, at birds. So also a good indication. Now, I said that we're going to head off to Chitwa. Hopefully see if Sabuyi and her cubs are around. Ooh. How many vehicles? Down it goes. No. Gone, and they can go away so quickly. Let's keep on moving.
Okay, if I'm not lucky with a leopard here, also by the way, I did go to the hyena den and it was inactive. So, do this so you can see my face. It was inactive, so we're going to go to Chitwa and hopefully we'll get lucky with a leopard there. Good luck and hopefully you will be able to find a leopard and talking of uh, squirrels food here we'll be talking of different animals on their food and i'm talking of some mammals and some reptiles as you can see in the background there and between them there's also there's also a stock now close to the water are the amphibians that we call the hippopotamus then the yellow billed stock comes in the middle, and further edge of the river are the reptiles, the crocodiles. Two different classes of species of, or animals here feeding differently, uh, having the hippos being herbivores, and you can see this on top of the hippo there. I'm not sure whether I'm seeing it right, but if it's a bird on top of one of the ox picker. The stock is basically also feeding on any invertebrates or crustaceans, worms, fish that could be in the water there. This is the yellow billed stock, sometimes called the wood stock, because you look on the color of the beak, it has that color of wood. A little yellowish. Oop, did you get enough? Time to move on. The crocs are out there already, and definitely they are getting lots of uh, vitamin D, of sunlight. They will need a uh, lot of solar energy to help in their digestion. This is one of the crossings, and I was right at this spot yesterday, and we were very lucky to some wildebeest and zebras crossing here. And unfortunately, we lost a few calves uh, to the crocodiles. Now, the crossing is always a gamble. It's always a chance game. Sometimes you come on good days, you see wildebeest in the zebras building, boom, they come and cross. Sometimes you come and they do not cross. So it's always the wheel of the wind. The whole idea is to just come, chant, and just be patient. You could be lucky. And the day before yesterday, uh, my colleague Isaac was on this river and he was walking in every crossing that he thought of. And he was not very lucky. Yesterday, I came to one of the points he stayed and he was like, you know, David, go to this particular crossing and if you're lucky, you know, you could be a crossing. We came, we were very patient, we stayed here and we got a crossing. And the zebras came from particular side. Now, the Mara River is very important to the ecosystem of the Masi Mara Game Reserve and the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And let's have more information about the river. The Mara River is a tree that brings life to this abundant African ecosystem. Thousands of animals live in and by its waters from docile herbivores to dangerous predators. Thirsty animals must visit the banks, while travelers must brave the unknown threats below the muddy surface. Hundreds of bird species find food along shores and below the surface of the waters. For much of the year, the resident Mara enjoy the bounty the river has to offer. While some are simply waiting for the few months when more than a million animals come in search of greener pastures. It is a temptation that overcomes even the most obvious of threats.
This is feasting time for one of the world's greatest reptiles. But it's not only the crocodiles that take a toll on the herds. Panic, currents, and cascading rapids account for an astonishing amount of deaths each year. The Mara River is a paradox, providing both life and death. Now, you would imagine us here, where we are in the African bushes, without water. So, water points, water sources are very important because all the animals here will need it. But unfortunately, sometimes, you know, like when we see uh, the wildebeest and the zebras crossing, like we saw yesterday, for those of you who are watching, it becomes a bit tricky when we get some of them, you know, being brought down either by the reptiles, the crocodiles in the water, or the lions that will lay ambush on the side. So, locally here, you know, with the help of the government, we have always make made sure we protect all the water sources uh, of these rivers here this being one of them to make sure that they don't get eroded we don't get a lot of deforestation going on in such areas to guarantee that the source of the Mara river remains for a long long time to come a classical example of animals that would suffer you know so badly are hippos because hippos without the water are gone you see how the flow is going there but i would imagine in there or under there we could be having crocs and of course so many other animals that depend on water for survival antelopes when they get thirsty when they don't get to other water points they'll always come here for a quick drink and then go do their business as usual rhinos the same giraffes the same so it's very important that we have a permanent and continuous uh, water sources in this area now i want to stick around in this particular part because when i came here yesterday i was here for a couple of minutes and then we saw will be building up and maybe today i could be lucky just like yesterday He's actually listening to us. He just took a few bites of grass. You can see the grass in his mouth there. And then turned towards us, just looking at the vehicle. Ah, not too worried. So the other stallion has moved off completely. Oh, no, he's, he's just around the corner. Never mind. I just looked over um, Craig's camera yeah, and just saw him to the left-hand side. But this uh, young stallion probably would have moved off if he also did. We were just talking about how he's got that unique, almost eye shape on his bum there. Interesting when you see shapes and, and uh, markings on animals, and you can often uh, try and identify them again. Actually had guests just a couple of days ago, and we, for example, found a female cheetah the one afternoon and we identified that or saw that she had three little spots below her eye that looked like tear marks and then a couple of days later we found a female cheetah again and saw the same three spots and obviously identified her i wonder if that's like a scar that he had on his side there you can almost see there's like a sp spot where the the stripes are not aligning completely right on the middle of his stomach there I wonder if there was a, a big scar down his side. You can almost see the line of a big cut. And when the skin fused again, the, lines, the stripes didn't align quite right. Wow, that must have been quite a dramatic injury. Amazing that he could survive something like that. Tinkerbell's mum, it is a very interesting uh, shape on his bum there and you can, even those uh, shadow stripes are, are quite, quite unique and it just shows you that every single zebra, <laughs> as the si as saying goes, even with leopards, all those spots are, are unique and all the, yeah, 
all the stripes are, are unique in it as well. And I, I think if we come past here, maybe this afternoon or in the next couple of drives, maybe with other, with other guides, maybe if you see this shape, you can let them know that you've seen the zebra before. <laughs> Quite interesting to, to identify animals like that. See how he's like slowly moving to the left because the older stallion is slowly but surely moving away as well. That tail is swishing a little bit and I think there's a few flies but it's not too hot yet. Often when it's really hot then the, the insects do Oh, you know, the insects are quite, is quite a, are quite a nuisance, but not for now. You can see, oh, there is the warm sun coming onto our backs now. Oh, that feels good. But the zebras are moving slowly away from us and further and further away. There's a watering hole just behind us. And I think Craig and I are going to go and see what's happening around there. We are staying here and not going anywhere, just hoping something may happen. And again, as I said, when we got here yesterday, we stayed for a couple of minutes, saw nothing. And from a distance, we saw some huts uh, of zebras building and then waited, came, tried to drink the water, went back, uh, wildebeest came in the water, went back, and finally it came to time to cross. So patience is very, very important here in the African wilderness. When you come to such areas, you always come and just wait and wait. Some stocks flying up there and not sure they're getting some feeding ground and definitely there could be something they want to feed on on the edge of the water. Now, I'm looking at the levels of this river here and trying to remember how far it had gone out on the bank and I think the levels have gone slightly bit down. The source of this river is very close to the village I come from and every time I will communicate to my villagers and they tell me they had some heavy storm or some big rain the day before or maybe that particular morning, I've always noticed a few hours later the levels rising up. Again, this is the yellow bill stock. We initially had one, but now we have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And look at them carefully, and you notice they got different colors. They're the same bad species, but of course, the different uh, because of their age. The gray ones, much younger, and the ones that are all white, clear uh, yellow bill, they are fully fledged and they are adults. Look at their long legs, which they use when to get in the water, so they cannot sink. But now look how she's feeding. She's moving very quietly, using her feet. So she'll use her legs, and you see her beak is quite open, so that when she moves and disturbs anything under the water, chances are it will jump forward, and very quickly, either she'll grab it, or she'll use her beak as a spear to sting it fast before she can take it to the mouth. Their feet got very special sensors. She may step on something and pick up the movement and very sensitive sensors. They pick any movement very easily and very quickly. Question all you are asking how you tell a male and a female for these stocks. These particular stocks are very difficult when you talk of sexual dimorphism. But the particular stocks that we know, like the sandal build stock, that you can very easily tell the difference. I'll be finding out for you much later, but I want to give you a classical example of one that I know very well that I have always loved since my college days, and it's called the sandal build stock. And we always look in the eye 
Now, when you look at the male, the male have brownish dark eyes, that is for the sandalwood stock. But if you look at the females, the females have yellow eyes. But for the uh, these stocks here, the yellow bill stocks, believe me, before the end of the day, I'll be finding out how to the difference between the males and the females, but that's a very good question. Apart from sometimes, you'll get the female being slightly bigger than the male, but I think we could get some more obvious difference uh, between the two. She may stop because sometimes a fish may just come swimming through and she'll very quickly sometimes step on it and then use the beak again as I said as a spear uh, to subdue it. The ones on the riverbank, they're definitely uh, sunning themselves up because if the water is a bit still too cold, they don't want to get to the water when it's very cold. And maybe most of the invertebrates in the water there also could be a bit slow in terms of movement and they know they'll not be very lucky in fishing. They just have to be patient a little bit. Of all the stocks, this happened to be my favorite stock. For only one body part, the yellow beak. When we used to grow as small little boys in my village, we had so many of them. We had a small little swamp of fresh water because most of these stocks, you always get them in fresh water areas. Uh, we had a small little swamp close to our village and they could, we could see sometimes during the breeding time, we could even see about 50 together and could just go there as boys and throw stones to them and they'll just fly away and like, yay, today I won. I had 20 of them in the air with only one stone. You can see the reflection in the water there as the water is just going downstream. Interesting, the hippos back there. See, they haven't got out of the water as yet. But you can tell they're sunning themselves on their backs comfortably now. And the small little birds I was talking about still are there. Charles, how are you today? And you want to know the lifespan of a hippo. Not sure whether you love hippos, just like me being such big, uh, big mammals. Uh, we got a few types of hippos, but in general, Charles, hippos average between 40 to 50 years. 40 to 50 years, Charles, is the lifespan of uh, these particular big mammals. But of course, again, as I said, we've got different species. We've got another species that we call the pygmy hippo, which do not live as long as these particular ones. But in general, 40 to 50 years is the lifespan of hippo. Potamas. If it warms up more, you'll get them out of the water because I want to believe they were busy the whole night feeding. So that's you see exactly why we call them semi aquatic mammals. As it is now, I would say they're half in water, half out of water. But at night, they'll go sometimes the whole night, 20, 30 kilometers, uh, looking for grass to feed on. The small little ox pickers uh, will be trying to get anything from uh, their bodies, but not necessarily ticks, but sometimes we have known them even to suck blood from uh, their skins. Again, crossing fingers, we'll get some uh, beasts or zebras coming across here and we'll be waiting. Well, to speaking about ox pickers, we found a herd of buffalo, one of the animals that they absolutely love to come and sit on and feed on the parasites and you know, even the, the blood of the animals if they are lucky to find one with the big scar. 
and this herd of buffalo is slowly feeding towards the road that we're standing on so I'm hoping that if we stick around here for a little bit they'll come even closer and closer. There's a few individuals that actually like this one that's on screen right now that's just been looking at the vehicle even since we stopped here not taking their eyes off of us. I think there's a bit of a breeze that's maybe even blowing our scent onto them. And I think that's also maybe making them a little bit weary of, of us. You can see this uh, this bull that's been that's an on screen now. You can see that nice thick big boss of horns that he's got on his head there. Not too old of a bull. His horns are not that big. But uh, just enjoy, enjoying this winter grass, uh, or I don't know how nice dry grass like this can be, but it seems like he's enjoying it. I'm sure after feeding on the dry grass like this, they'll have to get to some water later this morning. And the herd is spread out all over this place. Craig and I was just saying now that... Uh, this is a, the very spot where we saw Cheetah and her two youngsters um, the other day. And this herd of buffalo actually flushed them. And it was most probably the same herd of buffalo because it's literally not even 20 or so meters away from where they were lost when we saw them. Oh, look at this. There's actually one straight over my head. See if uh, Craig can get the camera onto it. Sam Sam, you are asking how much grass um, a buffalo can eat in a day. I'm not sure exactly in kilograms, but they do not feed the whole day. Because they are ruminants, they will be finding a spot and lying down and actually re-chew the, the food. Oh, remember how we were talking about the ox pickers just now? And look at there's one actually sitting on the horn of this one. So Sam Sam, let me get back to you. Um, and I'll see if I can figure out how much grass exactly a fully grown buffalo can eat. Look at that Red Bull ox picker. What a cool shot that is. Sitting on his horn and probably feeding on the ticks that's sitting around the horns. You can imagine there's some crevices and so that the ticks get in that the buffalo can't scratch off himself. <laughs> quite funny that the uh, ox picker has to hold on quite a bumpy ride. Look at that. Oh, look at the one on the left hand side there. It uh, looks like an old female. You can see the horns are quite thin, doesn't have that big boss. But she's got a broken horn on the other side there. Oh my goodness, that must have been painful. But you can even see the fur and how skinny she is. She must be quite old. Oh, there's a red bull ox picker that just flew to her as well. See, there's on her back. And he's looking around, seeing if he can see any ticks or so. And going straight for her horns and onto her face there. Look at that. You can see those horns have been, have a lot of wear and tear on them. And going back to the back again. <laughs> the red bull ox pickers obviously have quite a few clients coming around in this uh, herd for them to come and clean and so. So uh, we were talking earlier about um, how they will be maybe feeding on the blood of some animals if they have an injury, in which case they, they are parasitic. But in this case, where we can't see any scars or so, they actually have a symbiotic relationship with these buffalo. So they obviously get food by feeding on the ticks that have the blood inside them and the buffalo get rid of pesky parasites. But not only that, these red bull octopus, there is another one that flew in between them. Not only that, they also are extra eyes that can keep a lookout for predators. So are they all facing this way? Uh, 
Oh, look at this younger one is now moving back towards the herd on that side, maybe getting a little bit close <laughs> to the vehicle. Oh, a bit of horn showing to each other. <laughs> Looks like that's a young female that's there that's looking straight towards us. They are slowly feeding in this direction. I think they're heading to some water. But Craig and I are going to see if we can pick up on some tracks of some lions that's in the area. Oh, lions, that would be awesome. As for Subuyi here, she's no longer at the kill with the cubs. Everyone has had a good look around, including myself, and we didn't find her. But we have these little carnivores. Hello, dwarf mongoose. Very chilled out. Just four of them at the moment. Two there, and uh, two little ones on this mound as well. Can you hear the crested barbet and the African hoopoe? And the hoop hoop in the background, it's the African hoop hoop. The bush is starting to get really, really noisy as it does when it warms up. Oh, hello, you brave one. You're quite close to him, I say I'm a little bit surprised considering I'm talking and everything. Look. Ah, very close. They look very good. They're nice and shiny. Oh, what have you got there? Oh, just your own tail. So nice to have this close view of it, and you can see all the little details. Look at that tongue. Can't say I get to see a mongoose tongue very often. Oh, that was a pose. That was really a pose. Oh, this one is just adorable. Well, they're going about their morning routine, some sun, some grooming, and then off they'll go. A bit of foraging. Welcome back, everybody, to Simbambili, where we've been missioning around. We've caught an elephant now, beautiful big bull, who is uncertain of whether he wants to be on Simbambili or on Juma. Right now he's busy, was busy feeding. He's now picked up a branch that's been fed upon by somebody else. And it's possible he might be trying to find some ladies. animal disappears. Well, 
Well, that's how it works. We can try reverse back a bit, get him again. Mm, Paleon, that's a very good question. That's a question everybody wants to know. I mean, um, the greater Kruger National Park itself is a very, very big area. So these animals move. They all move between these properties. And there was a, a mindset years ago that the Kruger could only sustain 7,000. But that was before anybody did any research. Now, in the Kruger, there's probably more than 25,000 elephants. Don't know what the latest sort of statistic is. But we are and have seen lots and lots of impacts of elephants over the years. Pridelands, which is an area that's recently been opened up to the Greater Kruger, is seeing lots of elephant impact. They've had they were an area that was excluded for some time. Now the elephants are coming in to do what they do. Elephants um, change the structure of the vegetation. They damage the trees. They're not out to kill the trees. That's not their plan. It's just. Beast, can I move back a bit? Are you going to stay on him? Oh, he's going to move. Just stay on him. I'll just move back slightly. Elephants, through their behavior, through their feeding, damage and push trees over. And that is the natural way of things. And the savannah itself has evolved with elephant impact. Well, the two species or three of animals you got here, and I'm talking about the stalks, the crocodile, the hippos, will not change their ecological niche. They'll not change their ecosystem. I mean, this is their home because, as I said earlier, they need lots of water or they need water to survive. Now, look at one of those crocs there, and she got her mouth open. And there have been a few theories why these reptiles will open their mouths. And one of the theories that personally I've hold are close to my heart is to help them cool off. Now, Ona, I want to ask all of you a question here, because looking at that crocodile opening the mouth, and if you go with my theory that they open their mouth to cool off, we have seen them once in a while below their eyes having a dark streak, you know, like of tears just below their eyes. And I'm sure all of you have heard of this phrase, crocodile tears. So I'd want to ask all of you, what do you understand? What do you think the phrase means, crocodile tears? As usual, you can send us uh, your answers. Uh, you can tweet hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. What do you think we talk about when you use that phrase that crocodile shed tears or those are crocodile tears? I got the crocodiles there for you. Quite a distance <clears throat> for maybe my cameraman Bunge to show you the tears. It hasn't gotten too hot for us to see the tears, but what do you understand or what do you think that phrase means or translates into shedding crocodile tears and you notice they usually have very good con relationship between the two the hippos and the crocs Crossy, we have seen a few times crocodiles, if they get a possibility or an opportunity, we have seen them trying to catch small birds. It's not very common, but we have seen them trying to catch small little plovers that will come in the water. I mean, we know the old crocs are carnivores, of course, feeding on fish, the wildebeest and the zebras or antelopes that may come uh, to cross the river. But look at them. Those stocks definitely are too big for them. And we know crocs do not chew their food. They tend to cut uh, their flesh into big chunks and then swallowing it. So because of the feathers and the way the physiology of these birds here, they may not bother. But for small little birds, like small little lapwings or plovers, we have seen them uh, do that. 
We occasionally, <coughs> excuse me, have seen plovers going to the teeth of the crocodiles, knowing that they have eaten uh, some meat, and you see them pecking meat out of their teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, remember my quiz, why or what does the phrase crocodile tears mean? We, in our homes, we tell people, or we tell ourselves, you're shedding crocodile tears. What does that phrase uh, translate into? Tweet, hashtag World Earth, or hashtag CGTN Wild. A bit of swallows or swifts that you, fl you see flying over the water there. And basically, they are feeding. We see so many swallows and swift flying over the water and catching an insect that could be in flight. We've got swifts that spend hours and hours in flight feeding, and sometimes they just rest while still in the air. You can see one on your screen there. Very efficient in catching their food. And sometimes when they get tired, we have noticed they sleep and we are told sometimes they switch off half of their brain to give it a break and then later on uh, swap to the other half for them to reload and be able to fresh and remain still airborne, uh, feeding and moving. Some will come right on the surface of the water. I'm sure there's something they're seeing there uh, to feed on. And they always go in big flocks, five, 20, sometimes even almost 100. I like kingfishers, you know, that you'll always see them being very patient and looking uh, to what they could be feeding on. These ones are just fast, boom, in, catch and go. Kingfishers, especially uh, the Black and white kingfishers are always very patient. They'll come and wait. I'm talking about the pied kingfisher, and sometimes you just see them flapping their wings to mesmerize, for example, if there's fish under the water, and then just dive in, pick it up, and feed on it. These ones are just swift, and maybe that's where uh, the names come from. They just have to look very quickly, pick, eat, and keep going, keep flying. The current is not as it was yesterday, it's rather a bit quiet. I'm sure most of you are still working out uh, the answer to my quiz and I'll be happy to hear your answers later. crocodile on the move. I know you've been seeing lots of those. We especially up in the Mara with all the action going on. But down here we usually see them on the bank or staying very still in the water and it's nice to see them on the move. So we're here at Chitwa, De at Chitwa Dam. You can see it's leaving a trail behind it as it goes. Slinks through. Barely a ripple. A master at being undetected. You'd almost think it's moving with the current. And you can barely see it. See the slight movement of the tail side to side to propel it. And that position of the eyes and nostrils and the top of the head. So that it's able to keep the majority of its body in the water while it can still use its senses above water. I really do, do love these crocodiles. Carol, you'd like to know what the largest one I've ever seen is. Ooh, I did go to Croc World once upon a time in my life. In KZN. And uh, I think the largest specimen I've ever seen, obviously we get Nile crocodiles here, about three and a half meters, maybe four meters. You do get exceptionally large ones that it can get to about six meters. But uh, the ones I've seen are 
pretty much average sized average size Nile crocodiles. Can you imagine seeing a six meter croc? They're there, they're out there. In fact, you might see them there at the Mara. There's such a, a big population at the river. And you'll see them coming out of the wood woodworks in order to, to get a meal. Now it may end up at that bank, so I'm gonna just go a little bit forward so that we can see it emerge from the water. Hopefully it does. I feel like I'm racing the croc. It's definitely more stealthy than I am. All right, let's try here. Now where I'm from in KwaZulu Natal, we have the St. Lucia Wetland Park. It'll be actually the whole St. Lucia area. And it's the last place on earth you'd want to go and have a swim. It's an estuary. So you get Nile crocodiles, you get hippos, and you even get Zambezi sharks or bull sharks that come into, into the estuary during their breeding period. So not a fun place uh, to have a swim. Definitely wouldn't recommend it. And there you'll be able to see really, really large crocodiles. Hi, Lynch. You'd like to know what animal is a threat to a crocodile? Very, very few animals. A hippo and a crocodile can have a, a mean fight. But a, cro a crocodile is an apex predator, pretty much. We often forget that it is when we think about the predators out here. Think about lions, leopards, wild dogs. But crocodiles are an apex predator. Nothing is going to try its luck with it, except for a hippo who will feel, who may feel that it's in its territory and feeling a little bit intruded. There it goes, out it comes. Look at how much of that body was hidden by the water. Oh, I love this. Oh, just flop down there. You get some sun. Um, for speaking of predators, actually, of crocodiles, youngsters obviously do get taken. That goes for any species. Youngsters are, unfortunately, the ones that can be taken very easily. They're the most vulnerable. And little crocodiles will get taken by monitor lizards, by hornbulls, a whole variety of animals. But I have read that about a 1.5 meter croc has been found or had been found in the stomach of a python once upon a time. So depending on if you're sick, young, or ill, or just in bad condition, and very old, you can be taken by anything, but crocs are an apex predator. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Masai Mara. Look what we have here. We have a lilac breasted roller. A very good morning, everyone. You might be wondering where I am. I am here. My name is Isaac and on camera I have Big James uh, this morning. Um, to start with, I have a beautiful lilac view and 
and we knew more as we go on because I'm heading down to the river. But talk a little bit about this beautiful, beautiful African bird. And it's also found in the Arabian Peninsula. This is the national bird of Botswana, one of the most photographed bird in Africa. This guy looks like he's sunning himself. You can tell his feathers are all scruffy. Maybe he was wet and he's trying to dry them and then you know, they're gonna like look nice and beautiful. Remember this bird has got amazing colors from, from an array of, uh, you know, array of different colors, blue, brown, white, gray, you know, and those you know, two very long tail feathers. Um, it's of the roller family. They feed on little um, insects and uh, the, their name uh, derives from, you know, the behavior they portray. I have seen it a few times where they fly uh, very high in the sky. They make quite rather weird, you know, call. You know, you wouldn't think it's them. It wouldn't, you know, match their beautiful colors. And they fly quite high, then roll down like a bomber jet, you know, making this, you know, funny noise as they dive down really, really fast. Then before they hit the ground, they fly back up and they do it quite, you know, amazingly. I don't know if it's um, uh, a mating behavior because I've never seen the mate after that, but it's rather a very amazing, you know, kind of um, behavior. Yeah, this guy looks like he's had a good breakfast. He's resting there. They have amazing ability to see you know, from where he is down and to see anything that's flying or, you know, jumping from one grass to the other. So he might be also be hunting from that patch. Yeah, and th there's no much wind. And also he's on the end side of the tree, so the wind is not hitting him as much. So I'm sure he's getting the sun full on and that's what he wants. The tree he's on is a desert date. It does produce dates, jackals, elephants, even young boy, Maasai boys and other tribes do eat the dates from this tree. We also, you know, we, you know, we eat them, but they're not very edible. They're not very, like, sugary, like the dates uh, we get from uh, the supermarket. Yeah, that's a beautiful scene that we have here. Today it looks like we have very bright blue skies in the Mara. It's gonna be nice and hot, and uh, and and it looks like it's going to be a very beautiful day to head down and see what's happening by the river. Remember to talk to me on hashtag CGTN uh, Wild and hashtag Wild Earth. Uh, that's where you can get me for comments and uh, any questions. I'm gonna move further up, see what I can find for you guys this morning. Absolutely correct, Isaac. I mean, anytime you hit the river, you will. Happening. I mean, a drink, a crossing, elephant swimming, hippos that we have there, uh, crocs that you see out there. We say out in the bush, water is life. And who knows? It's a long river, so I'm sure I'm at one. And maybe Isaac might choose to go to a different point. And. You might be surprised, we'll have, you know, different sighting and different uh, happenings on the same river. Now, what I would be happy to see is all these hippos come out, but the temperatures would still be a bit low. So as it warms up much uh, further, you will definitely get all of them out of the water there's a little dark there and i'm thinking this is a yeah an egyptian geese yeah there's an egyptian geese there a little bit strange to see it alone uh because they normally go in pairs and i'm imagining maybe the other mate's not very far yes correct so that's an egyptian geese there I should even have asked you what uh, duck that is. As much as we call them uh, geese, uh, they belong to the same family uh, with the ducks. And definitely either for a drink. I mean, uh, 
and feeding also on the surface of the water. They do, they're more vegetarians and they are, they, than they are of carnivores because you get them eating leaves and uh, eating small, you know, stems and getting some seeds out, you know, when they're out there on the terrestrial areas feeding on the dry land, but also they'll come to the water to look for some planktons, any small little uh, plants that will grow on the surface of the water. Beyond Beyond Square Zero, I am very happy to hear your answers and your talking of fake sympathy or false tears. I mean, uh, I want to agree with you. You are very correct. You remember I had a quiz earlier on the crocodiles and you're absolutely correct. Is ideally fake sympathy or false, false tears. Now, look at those crocs there. And most reptiles got this very hard covering. The outer part of their bodies, the carapace, is always very hard. And you'd imagine they would want maybe to lower down the temperatures as much as they're not like the mammals. So for crocodiles, they can only do that. Uh, below their eyes, they's, they got a very small, I would call, a very small sweat, uh, sweat gland. And that's what they use when it gets very hot for them uh, to sweat or to lower, help a little bit lower their body temperatures. And their sweat gland has a tear duct in it. And what happens if they're out of the water for a very long time, the eyes will want or the eyes will dry up and what they will do they will weep or they'll try to lubricate their eyes and in so doing uh, the tears that will come out because it's they are very concentrated they just make a small little you know, line down there and it's very sticky and you're all right that's how we ended up saying or oh, the phrase crocodile tears which actually are not tears but they're just you know fake tears and not actually crying it's just the lubrication they'll make the eyes that they don't uh, dry up being out in the water for so long. Very proud of your answers, very correct. And again, remaining where I am, crossing fingers to maybe see uh, some other mammals building up here. Good luck, Gigi. Well, I really hope you do get a crossing. Uh, we had some lovely impalas in the open. They've all decided that they didn't want to be on camera. You can see them, a small little group of them. There's a little yearling impala with the horns. They are actually very camouflaged in this autumn sort of winter, sort of, should I say winter gr uh, brownness. Very camouflaged. Unless they move, they're not very easily seen. What are we hoping by coming across this herd they might detect a leopard for us because everybody seems to be looking for a leopard this morning. And we've had a feeling about going down this road and the alertness of this impala, although not alarm calling, the alertness is of interest. Normally takes between half an hour and about an hour after a leopard or a lion tries to attack these animals for them to calm down again. Now, there are many antelope species in South Africa and there are quite a few differences between those in the Maasai Mara and down here in South Africa. Across Africa, there are 72 species of antelope living in diverse habitats from desert to rainforest. On the vast plains of East Africa, speed is crucial to escape being devoured by hungry predators. And they don't come much faster than the Thompson's gazelle. Meanwhile, during the Kalahari's scorching days and frosty nights, the Gemsbok's ability to regulate its temperature can come in quite useful. 
but none are as sneaky as the common daikid, who in the dense thickets of the Kruger woodlands rely on camouflage and stealth. In the Masai Mara, the impalas are showboaters with impressive horns. While in the Kruger, the impala are smaller, but their density is far greater. The Mara's yearly highlight is the arrival of nearly 1.5 million wildebeest. The herds further south barely compete. But it's not all about numbers, as the intimacy of a wildebeest birth in the Kruger woodlands is sublime. Each environment has its own set of rules, and every antelope species has to rise to the challenge. Welcome back live with us here in Juma in the Sabi Sands, where we've got our antelope in Paul, the most common antelope we find in the Kruger. And there was a question posed about how many elephants can these areas sustain, and no one really knows to be sure but one thing is for sure is there are lots of impala and the effect that impala have on the vegetation is not as easily seen elephants will push trees over and damage trees that makes it very obvious but impala are mixed feeders which means that they feed on grass when it's green and leaves on forbs trees when they are when it is out of season so how many baby trees little tree saplings are are eaten and possibly even killed by huge herds of impala well that is very unknown very unknown so just because elephants make a lot of impact doesn't mean that their behavior is devastating to the vegetation but large herds of animals such as impala can be quite detrimental to the environment certainly does. Everything has a place and every action has a reaction and causes chains of events and ends up in these beautiful circles that we call life. Here we have a leopard orchid. I think it's stunning. It's flower, which is just gorgeous. It's here in Chitwa. It's the orchid that we know and see. It's just, it's so pretty. I had to show it to you. Now these are epiphytes which means that they don't they don't destroy the tree they don't tap into the tree's vascular system to try and get nutrients so they're not parasitic they're just epiphytes which means they just need the tree for some structural support and then it kind of self-sustains itself All the old vegetation falls in on itself and it uses that as a bit of compost and that's how they grow and the little roots that they create are quite sugary and monkeys like it they often chew on it and they're called leopard orchids because they sometimes have little brown spots in them difficult to see here in fact this particular one i haven't seen it with brown spots i've seen it mostly this lovely pale yellow and epiphytic orchids like this have amongst the world's smallest seeds now this is the largest orchid of all the species in South, southern Africa but epiphytic orchids can have seeds that are about less than one millionth of a gram tiny tiny seeds to produce this beautiful set of flowers So 
we have all seen but with larger leopard orchid we've got a couple of elephants we've got a thing and then of course the impala which have a down to drink here at Prydlands. there's also two other bulls that are around and probably going to terrorize everybody that is now writing their apprentice field guide exam yep there's some students well some soon-to-be safari guides and hopefully once they pass that then the next week will be about assessments and they'd at least go far look at that pathway that they've made though it's quite difficult for them to walk in that area especially when there has been a lot of rain the elephants sink deep on down into the mud <laughs> what have you seen i'd have seen some people walking in camp What are you looking at, boys? Everybody's normally very busy at this time of the day in camp. So maybe it was just someone walking around, but they keep looking <laughs> inside there. Where are you going to go now? One of these elephants. I think it's the other one. We'll see when they come closer, because I have no doubt that they're probably going to come around to us and say hello. They just cannot resist. Is that our naughty friend, Sebastian? We need to check his left tusk does it have a notch in it no no these are not the the elephants that come and give us trouble and camp every now and then these boys are are fine now hi dev it's great to hear from you um elephants actually sleep a fair amount funny enough um but they can also go long periods without any sleep at all. But then eventually they need to, to sort of catch it up. It was... Oh, excuse you, elephant. No, that one sounds like it's a little bit of an upset stomach. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so, Dev, there's been a recent study that's um, that's been done, which has been very interesting, again, thanks to technology. But everyone thought that an elephant would sleep a couple of... Uh, hours a day or sometimes just have so short siestas but you know every single day and then they put a I suppose a, a Fitbit like object around the part of an elephant that constantly keeps moving which is of course its trunk you can see they use their trunk for lots of things we know that they use them to help feed and of course as this elephant is demonstrating to also uh, use their trunks to help them drink and um, that idea of putting that um, object on an elephant's trunk is to see when it goes stationary and there was one elephant that I think went about 72 hours without any sleep at all and then slept for a significant amount of time a couple of hours after that so it just kind of depends you can imagine a young elephant needs a bit more rest than an adult elephant so as we come into the summer months it's not it's exceptionally hot during the day so of course they'll come and swim and and roll around in the mud and cool themselves off and maybe have a dust bath afterwards and then they normally find a nice big tree a marula tree a big leadwood or an apple leaf something that's got a great canopy on it and then they'll stand motionless underneath it and have a siesta for maybe 20 minutes 30 minutes an hour two hours but then it's also not that uncommon for some of the bigger elephants and the younger elephants to lay on their sides and um and then i suppose have a have a proper rest so I think it just depends. Are these animals moving quite frequently to find new water and food? Then they might move longer distances without stopping before they reach, I suppose, their next sort of favorite spot. But in this area, they're not traveling too much. We're kind of seeing the same herds um, only moving a couple of kilometers every single day. Um, but as it gets hotter, I think that more siestas will take place during the nice, cool winter months. Uh, then they seem to be fairly active and, and feeding um, throughout the day but it also just depends from elephant to elephant I suppose but my favorite is actually watching big elephant bulls that have got rather large tusks you can imagine it must be quite tiring carrying around those big tusks all the time and um, especially if you're like an elephant called Ezelwini who is he's got enormous enormous tusks and I've seen with some bulls how they'll actually hang their heads in lower hanging branches about that guys but we 
are now heading oh, out of Chitwa and into Juma. And I think I'm going to check out the Mulwati. Yesterday I was looking for a python that has been seen in the Mulwati. In fact, there were about four different vehicles trying to locate this python. So I think let's have a go today and see if we can find it. Apart from that, there's been a strong smell from yesterday and I passed the same area today and it's still very strong of a leopard scent marking. So it's a smell of the leopard's urine that smells, as you would know, very much like popcorn. It's strange when you smell it and it smells so pleasant. It almost has that warm, fresh quality to it like good popcorn does. So somebody's definitely been frequenting this area. We just, just need to find out who it is. I think it is Tandi. I've seen it here many times. Ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh. Looks like some little bee eaters. Can you see it there? Awesome. They're so wonderful to see. Oh, someone's got something. Yep. Just scrape it against there. It's got a bee. So they're called bee eaters because, in fact, they do like bees. And that's how they get the sting off the bee. That is awesome. It's so exciting to catch these little things. Oh, down the hatch. Was that good? No, I think it's satisfied. I'm so glad to see them. Such beautiful birds. A lot of the trees have been teeming with bees at the moment. Even around camp, you walk around and you just hear this hum of the bees buzzing about. Both of them are now together. So they'll be having a good meal. And what's nice about them is that they tend to return to the same branches. If they sit on this branch or that branch, they tend to return and they'll stick around in this similar area. At least for the duration of them hunting. How pretty is that? <laughs> They're moving all about. gone onto the ground. I can't see them at the moment. Gentlemen, oh. I'm mobile. Oh, out again. Well, I'm going to stick around with them and see what they get up to. Hopefully I'll get another live kill of a bee. And here we have found the, t the tallest of them all. And looks like he's had a very good morning. Chewing his cut is what he's doing right now. And curiously and inquis very inquisitively looking at me like, um, you know, he's, he's going to ask me a question. This is a very fully grown Maasai giraffe. From a distance, you, you know, if you didn't look carefully, you could not make out in between trees and him. Good, you know, good camouflage. He's blending really well. Not as well because now you can see him, but from a distance, you know, you, you know, 
differentiate. You know, those trees, you see them, they say the same one I showed you, the lilac breasted roller earlier. Um, the reason they have that shape, it's because the giraffes do the under browsing. So they never have enough leaves. Together with the elephant, they give them that umbrella shape. This is not an acacia. This is a desert date. And that giraffe from miles and miles is just himself. There's nobody else. But giraffes have got amazing eyesight. From where he is, he could be able to see a female or another male. So there's nothing to worry. A good advantage with the height, anything approaching, he can, you know, see. And apart from lions, um, people, hyenas and and leopard, uh, leopard and hyenas can take young ones, fully grown, you know, fully grown ones are taken only by lions and human beings. So when he's here, he's, you know, no under any threat. He's very comfortable. He can see all around and he's very, very, very happy. Uh, he's getting a little bit of shade from the tree. So he's comfortably, you know, chewing. Yeah, I'm gonna you know, want you to watch how he's you know, chewing that um, cud and you'll see him swallow it. Then, it, you know, for a few seconds, you just wait. And if you look at the neck, you'll see something like a ball, you know, come up, pushed up. And, you know, he chewed, she chews it again. Uh, with a, this ruminant, they normally fill up their rumen and then after filling it it's like automatic they'll stay still and regurgitate the ball after what they've been you know wanting to be diluted the cellulose is diluted by all the bacteria inside comes up they chew it and then properly take it to the other the reticulum the omasum and the obasum, they finish up there, then it comes out as pallets. Let's have a look at, you know, the neck um, when he swallows. I'm going to want you to watch this keenly. Okay, he swallowed, it's gone down. Watch the neck. I don't know if you're going to see the, the ball come up. There it is. <laughs> I didn't see it really 100%. Tammy, um, you say it's your first time seeing rumination. Maybe um, it wasn't uh, properly explained, but I'm sure you have seen uh, because cows do it, goats do it. So, you know, maybe you, definitely you have seen it. It's only maybe it hasn't been explained. And the giraffe does this very well. And it is necessary for giraffes to do this because they're very vulnerable. Yeah, so they don't need, you know, to eat uh, much. Yeah, they just fill up. They can ruminate while watching around. I must say that's a very beautiful, beautiful, you know, screenshot we got there. But I'm going to leave this guy to continue his eating and find something else farther down. Well, I was going to leave these guys. Once they'd flown away, but then this one came back. Oh. I just gave a really nice aerial display. They would really, really be enjoying themselves with the insects that are now out. Black collared barbet calling in the background. Absolutely love the Mowati for birds. Blends in so well with its green and yellow. And 
into this bush willow, the russet bush willow that it blends into. Are you going to fly for us? Show us just how spectacular you are. Platter boy, you say what beautiful coloring. Just gorgeous. Gorgeous coloring. Yellow. We've got that green. You've also got this browny color on it, as well as like little hints of blue, at least I think, around the eye. It's almost like eye shadow. So, so brightly colored. Now, birds actually have four color receptive or cones in their eyes, so like us, they can detect green, blue, yellows, reds, the usual, but they do have the green, blue, red cones. But they have an additional one that can detect ultraviolet light. So even though this bird is stunning to us, it's even more beautiful when other birds look at it. There'll be a certain brightness in the colors and even additional bits that we can't see. A lot of the time when it comes to UV light for birds, it kind of amplifies, oh, and off it goes, amplifies the light that we, or the colors that we can already see, kind of makes it glow. But there'll also be bits that we're not able to see. And all of those, those colors make them very attractive to their mates. Bird vision is excellent. And we can continue chatting about it when we see some more birds. Thanks, Trish. Well, we were talking about elephants earlier and uh, how they change the structure of the vegetation. Now, what this elephant, well, there's no elephant right here, but this, an elephant has come here and has actually physically ripped up this entire tree. These are roots here. Ripped it up, but it's still solid on the other side. So the structure here, the shape where this tree was sitting, a bit of shade on the ground, and now it's been ripped up and pushed over there. So this area now by my feet is a lot softer, a lot easier to dig into. The soil is quite soft here. And the shade dynamic that over here has changed. Now this is exposed to the sun. It's also been ripped up. What I've got in my hand here is actually a root. Elephants will pick up the roots. Can you believe it? And snap this with their, their tusk. Oh, I don't even know how. That is heavy. That weighs about 10 kilograms, that root. And they rip up the entire plant looking for this wonderful cambium. The bark. The outer layer of the bark. Which they'll then put in their mouth and they'll of two. Um, so, you know, this tree's been damaged, it's been badly damaged, but it's not going to die. The tree is still connected to the ground. There's a massive root system still in the ground there. But what it's done is it's changed the dynamic of this exact area where this root I'm sticking ground much softer. Um, all sorts of things are going to change here. So plants that were growing here before that like the shade are going to change to plants that like the sun. And on the other side where the tree's fallen down, it's going to be the opposite. You're going to have plants there that like the sun before. They're now going to be shaded. Um, but also, you know, the tree is not dead. The tree will still survive. It'll just look a little bit different. And that's what I mean by changing the structure. Structure is the sort of the, the way the vegetation looks, how it stands, how it stands, where there's shade, where there's cover, and all those sort of things. This is one of our very common trees in the area called the red bush willow. Megan, you're in awe of how strong they They are beasts, absolute beasts. Think of the strongest man you know. The biggest man I think I've ever met weighs 
130 kilograms, so that's 260 odd pounds. Okay, now an elephant, big elephant, weighs about 10,000 pounds, maybe 12,000 pounds. Think about that. Think of the strongest man you know, weighs 260, maybe 300 pounds, maybe 300 pounds. Now go to 12,000. There's just no comparison. No comparison. To be able to break that with your, with your tooth, listen, listen to the sound. Solid, solid. I don't even think I could swing this as a baseball bat. It's very heavy. And they just snapped it like it was nothing. Boom, that's the mic drop. Anyway, I find it fascinating how they've dug in here, torn this apart, pushing it over. Okay, so elephants are so important to the system. What they do here, changing the structure, moving it around, depositing dung, it's a very important element of why we call them keystone species. Elephants are an iconic keystone species of the wilderness. And they've captured our hearts and minds like no other. The herds are fascinating to observe and incredibly important to the health of the African ecosystems. They are environmental architects and with around 15,000 at last count in the greater Kruger area, their impact influences all life around them. Elephants live in complex communities with calves being raised by relatives and friends. Their playfulness and intelligence is endearing. And with more than 30 years of human activity in the area, the elephants of the Sabi Sands have become relatively comfortable around our vehicles. But we must always guard against becoming complacent in their awesome presence. As with a respectful and sensitive approach to these intelligent creatures can come some moments of profound connection to the wilderness. You're back live with us on a Juma with a very big pile of elephant dung and they are such important organisms inside these large areas. We call elephants keystone species that you learned about now. If you remove them from the system, the system will collapse. But what they also are is something known as an umbrella species. An umbrella is something that covers a whole lot of things. You know, if you use an umbrella in the rain, it covers. So they call it an umbrella because to conserve elephants, you need a very large area. So inside that area, the umbrella to conserve elephants, you've got dung beetles, bee eaters, leopards, lions, so many little things in between that all encapsulated in the greater overall conservation of the elephant. So we call it umbrella because to keep them, you need a very big area, rocky areas, mountainous areas, river run areas, dry areas, bush areas, all those sort of things. And all those habitats have multiple, multiple millions of species, plants and microbes and insects and all that sort of thing. Okay, another important reason behind elephants is their dung. And this pile of poo over here is just one of many that an elephant will deposit every single day. And uh, if I just open up a little bit here, you'll see there is sticks from the, the trees, um, bark, lots of bark. There'll be some leaves in here. And uh, the purpose behind all of this is there's a huge amount of organic material here that many, many other organisms will be able to feed on, live in, breed in, and organic material being recycled back to the soil. It's my absolute favorite thing to do, as I'm sure most of you have worked out, is to spend the early afternoons and, well, the early mornings here at Nlovu Dam because it is so productive. It actually just beats driving on. We've got more chance of 
coming across a variety of species at this watering hole than anything else. So I think most safari guides that work in the greater Kruger region will say that in winter months, the middle of the year, is the best time. Because I suppose finding animals is a lot easier and that definitely helps. <laughs> but here we have uh, four or five elephant bulls. One is just hiding behind the other, coming down for a quick drink. And last night they were having an absolute party in the dam. I don't know if it was this lot. They didn't look like they've got any water marks on them. But there were definitely a few splashing around and having a sneaky midnight swim. Maybe we will, will see some swimming elephants too. But for now, just slurping up trunkfuls of water and popping them in their mouth. So those trunks can hold a fair amount of liters, about 10 liters or so. All books say something different. You can you can decide what you want to go with, but it's somewhere around around that. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I think it also depends on the size of the elephant that will determine something like that. And none of these are fully grown elephants. They've still got a long way to go. But they might not drink all the water that they need to drink in one go because they know that this water is here and they're not traveling very far as we were talking about before. So they'll most certainly be back this afternoon. The temperatures are supposed to get to around 33, 34 degrees Celsius, which is very, very warm, not quite the hottest. I mean, in the peak of summer, it's not unusual for temperatures to rise in 40 degrees Celsius, but definitely the warmer weather than what we've been having. And there's no wind too. So that's not going to help cool the animals down. So they're going to need to spend some time here and cover their bodies with mud to help keep them cool. Now, Ashley, you're just 12 years old and I love that you've asked this question about how useful is an elephant's trunk? It's the most useful part of on their bodies, I suppose. I mean, their tusks are pretty handy as well. But um, those those trunks are filled with muscle, so there's no bones in there. So firstly, they're very flexible and they can move in all sorts of uh, directions. But as you can see, it would be very difficult for an elephant to drink if it didn't have a long trunk. Because I don't think that they've quite got the flexibility like a giraffe to be able to spread their legs, their front legs open wide and then stick their heads down to the crown to drink water. They'd maybe have to go on their knees or something like that if they, if they didn't um, have those long trunks. And then those trunks also help them feed too. So they've got those two little uh, finger-like tips um, right at the end of their trunk and they can pick up a tiny little twig without breaking it. Um, so it's very, very useful. You know, they will pull down branches um, by stretching their trunks up, so getting food at a whole nother level that maybe other animals wouldn't be able to feed on. So I think without an, a trunk, a life, well, the life of an elephant would be a lot more difficult. But yeah, but they'll use that, and I, I'm hoping that they do go for a swim, and then we can see how they'll scoop up mud with the trunks too, and then afterwards they'll also cover themselves in, in dust which is really cool. It's all really pretty to see, especially when there's no wind because the dust just lingers for such a long time. But you can see every single day it's getting drier and drier out here. The water hole is getting smaller. Look at that. I reckon some of you would be able to share some screenshots maybe from when we first started broadcasting from Pridelands to show how the dam has actually changed in size. It would be really nice if you could all see that. Just remember to use the hashtags and compare it with uh, a picture from either today or the last few days because, I mean, we're always at this dam. And you'll even see how the vegetation is completely thinned out. Almost all the trees around the dam haven't got any leaves on, barring the leadwoods. Uh, they've got some nice pods at the moment. The apple leaves have still got their have got some uh, leaves on them, but everything else seems to be quite bare. And then, of course, if there is a knob thorn, there should be a few flowers developing on them now, and it won't be long before they get their leaves too. I just really love how nature works and how it doesn't give everything at once, you know, especially during this time where there isn't any rain. It just gives, every, you know, like with the knob thorn flowers, oh, that's great for all the insects and a lot of the bird species. Um, and some of the mammals that, of course, also feed on the flowers or give them a bit of sugar, a bit of an energy boost. 
and I'm sure it's but maybe a bit tastier than eating <laughs> bark <laughs> or dried grass. I couldn't think of anything. I mean, I could think of lots of things that are worse to eat, but if you're an elephant, unfortunately, that forms part of your diet, and there's not much you can do at this time of the year. Let's see who's going to be the first one to have a wallow. Come on, boys, it's getting nice and hot now. If I had my swimming costume on, I'd probably join the elephants in this dam. It's very possible, Taylor, I would see those elephants wallowing. And not sure you'll believe true that you'll see elephants wallowing. You may even see elephants swimming in the water. And ellies are a lot heavier, maybe two, three times heavier than hippos. But hippos will not swim in the water. You know, and when you talk of physics and then you're told of the language of densities, then it makes everything very complicated for me. But it's very interesting when you know that a hippo cannot swim in water as much smaller and lighter uh, than an elephant. So you've got more numbers of hippos now on the edge of the water. Now, the one standing, I'm not sure why she is standing and not just laying, the two of them rather, not laying down to get more, but I think what they could be doing, they are exposing more of their body parts to get more solar energy. I mean, you'd wonder two are laying down and two are standing up. And my only thinking here is they want to get uh, more body parts to get more sun. Having been out the whole night feeding because it was cold, having been in the water, you know, since morning, they need to be uh, to warm up. And of course, the sun also helps them uh, for vitamin D like every other uh, living animal. Sometimes you'll see on the ears and the eyes uh, of these uh, big amphibias here being a bit reddish because of some uh, oily secretion that they always have, which just helps them. As much as they could be out in the sun for a long time, it helps them not to dry off and they don't get cracks uh, on the skin. So it moistens uh, the skin, but also I believe it could also act as some nice sunblock. Others should imagine being out in the open the sun there for a couple of hours. Uh, for hippos especially, it is quite sensitive. Small little ba uh, birds still jumping on their backs there. Trying to get anything they can. Uh, and if they don't get any parasites, we have known them to use their sharp beaks like scissors just to suck blood from their skins. You can see the width of the Mara River there. And that must be a crocodile in the move. Not sure she's fishing or she's looking for something to eat. Good buoyancy. Good swim, just floating and gliding uh, on the water. Still being patient where we are and thinking we might see some wildebeest or other animals coming here for a drink or a crossing. Parents? Spotted eagle owl in the Mawati, where we used to see them that live here last year. And a little youngster that we call Seb. Just lovely. You can see that they're close to the ground, and I've actually been looking out for their nest. Because I suspect that that they will be nesting. They don't have a specific nesting period, but it will peak around this time. August, September. And I was going to chat to you about why this owl's eyes look like they're closed. Because it is not asleep. And instead, I'm going to ask you, so why don't you use the hashtag CGTN Wild or the hashtag Wild Earth and tell me why this owl's eyes are closed? Why are their upper eyelids, which are 
quite large and very similar to humans, which is why they can have quite a human-like face sometimes. Why they look like they're closed. Let me know. Hashtag Wild Earth, hashtag CGTN Wild. Linma, you say fantastic camouflage. Absolutely. I drove past and then I looked back and I managed to see it just in the right... My eyes happened to be at the right place at the right time. But you could so, so easily miss it. Very, very, very well camouflaged. And you can actually look and see the talons really, really well. Look at those. Wow. Great for grabbing prey with. Just great. I'm very happy about being in a Mawati at this time. I saw a kudu and I saw some impala around the area, which means if there's anything happening in terms of predators, we will know about it. It's like having a, a security system. But these owls will be very silent. They're not particularly vocal creatures anyway, because silence helps them catch their prey. Thank you we'll so just much for the yeah. You can see the occasional stray feather blowing in the breeze. And you can hear a hornbill behind us saying, what about attention for me? So remember the quiz? Why is this animal's eyes closed or look closed because they're not actually closed and uh, you'll need to think about light and the structure of their eyes things like that Hi, Beyond. You'd like to know if the feathers on its head actually have a function. Looking at the ones that look like eyebrows. Well, scientists are actually in two minds about it, strangely. We call them ear tufts because they look like ears. But we're not sure exactly what its function is. It doesn't assist in hearing as much as you would think. In fact, most research shows that it doesn't. But it may signal to other owls, or specifically within their species. So to other spotted eagle owls, it may signal something. It may assist in camouflage, but we're not sure. What we do know is that their ears are on either side of their head, which makes sense, much like yourself. And they're positioned differently so that light, uh, so that sound waves reach the ears at just a fraction of a second different at a different time. So that minuscule change in timing between whether the sound wave reaches the left or the right ear can help the animal distinct very quickly distinguish where their prey item is and they need to do this very silently which is also why they don't make a lot of sound they also have facial discs small little feathers that are around their eyes 
that help direct sound towards the ears. So even the ear, even though the ear tufts look so obvious and they look like, oh, they must contribute to something, we haven't found out exactly what just yet. Perhaps they also can detect a vibration much like the short veined feathers around the eye in those eye discs, in those facial discs but they don't seem to have a similar structure to the feathers in the facial discs, which have a very thick vein and very fine feathery bits. They seem to be quite normal feathers like you see on the head. You'll see them moving those ear tufts sometimes as well. Sometimes they are flat against this, their head. Sometimes they pick it up. So remember guys, why does its eyes appear to be closed? What could it be doing and why is it helpful to it? Use the hashtag Wild Earth, hashtag CGTN Wild, and let me know and we can have a chat about it. I would be happy to join in Trishala's uh, question and maybe become a prepat and maybe wonder if I could use incognito name what should think of my answer. Well, we haven't seen any uh, herds of uh, zebras or will be scamming to cross, but we have remained happy watching our hippos coming out of the water. And I'm sure you all know the big five as you're all pondering to give Trishala the answers. I also want to ask you, uh, you know, pose a question to all of you because you know the big five. All of you know what are the big five animals of Africa. And I would like to ask you, why don't you think the hippopotamus that you see there is not one of the big five? Unless you don't know which ones they are, which are the elephants, buffaloes, leopards, lions, and rhinos. Those are the big five of Africa. I would want to tell you the hippopotamus is one very dangerous animal, but it's not one among the big five. Why do you think the hippopotamus is not one among the big five? Hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag World Earth on Twitter. Changing position again as they come out, depending, of course, I would say in the direction of the sun. That's how they're enjoying it. Tim, how long the hippos stay out of the water? It depends on the day, Tim, number one. Number two, I would say also it depends on the age. But roughly anything three to five hours, they'd be out of the water. The big difference is, is in their breathing. Well, out of the water, like now, they'll breathe consistently or continuously. But well, in the water, there's still a challenge every three, five minutes. They'll have to put their nostrils up to get carbon dioxide out and a bit of oxygen in. But three to five hours, again, depending uh, on the age and the amount of sun, and sometimes a few factors uh, like safety. If there could be a concern, for example, of a pride of lions here, a concern of other predators like hyenas, they'll definitely very quickly uh, retreat in the water. <coughs> Excuse me. And if those uh, predators will just remain by the bank of the river, the hippos will also remain in the water uh, throughout. Hippos continue enjoying the sun because the same sun is coming to us. And I think all the three species of the crocodiles and us and the hippos are enjoying the same sun. We are indeed enjoying the sun, Gigi, and you are back with us live in June. Everybody, we are elephant. There's three elephant bulls here. I think we had them a few days ago on the show. One big bull and a couple of younger ones. And they're busy just enjoying a little bit of breakfast. Oh. 
all day. I go about feeding. Right now it seems as if they are busy with some grass. Some of the grasses like the other day that grow underneath the trees. I spoke a little while ago about how the elephant pushes that tree over. And there are certain grasses that like to grow in a bit more shade. And some of those grasses are accessible to elephants when they push trees over or move bushes out the way. And so they'll be ripping those up, knocking the soil off with their trunk against their body and then eating the grass and the roots all at once. So the disturbance that these animals create is all natural to this environment. This environment has evolved with disturbance from these keystone species. And many, many organisms benefit from the actions and behavior of elephant. And it's for that reason, if they are removed completely, the ecosystem will not be the same. completely agree with you, Eve. Um, I mean, elephants are my favorite animal, but we all know how important they are uh, to the wonderful wildlife. But finally, some of the elephants have decided to take to the mud bathing that we were talking about just um, a little while ago, having a great time. At one point, there was an elephant that was laying flat and not even moving. He just decided, I'm going to take up the entire wallow and no one else will be able to cover themselves in mud because this is where I need to have a 15-minute siesta. I kid you not, I had to actually get my binoculars out and have a look to make sure that it was still breathing. I've never seen an elephant sit so still. So that was fantastic. I suppose they get tired, hey, moving around all the time, constantly. They're always doing something, an elephant, so you can't blame them when they just want to have a little bit of a break. But even today, they're not aggressively throwing mud all over themselves. Normally they're so excited. But the bush was alive last night. So elephants, did you also not get much sleep? Again, not that they sleep for set amount of hours and at particular times they can sleep any time. Here's one elephant. Might get a bit more wild now. One has decided to move his foot back and forth quite a bit, loosening all the mud while the others just sort of stand around. I don't know if they're waiting their turn. I feel like if you wanted to other elephants, you could just push on in there and find a spot. No, and of course there's always, always just one that'll enjoy themselves than the others. Some of them are actually moving off, surprisingly. There we go. There's a third one trying to find its way into that little mud wallow. It's getting shallower and shallower too. It used to be quite wide, which made it easy for multiple elephants to fit in there. But that fellow over there, he's taking up all the space. See one down on his knees. There we go. And they're also helping one another by doing that. By kicking their foot around, splashing all that mud on underneath their bellies. <laughs> <laughs> Literally bottom to bottom right now. Get out of there, this is my space. Oh, now this is the tricky part, is not slipping on the way out. Oh, they're all very relaxed, as you can see. It's so lovely. It's so, I love this dam. It's so peaceful around here until the big herd of buffalo come about and a few of the breeding herds which i'm sure will follow soon been seeing lots and lots of tracks for both of those species so they can't be too far away and most of the boys heading off now they're finished come on give us a dust bath that'll just be great to see ah sebastian it's not the elephants or the breeding herds and it's not the Buffalo that are coming in, but it's our other friend. Hello, Warthog. 
Now, this particular individual is a warthog that we've been watching for quite some time, and he often spends most of his day in camp. But I'm really, really happy to see it's been a long recovery, but he had an injured foot, and he wasn't doing so well. And he had a severe limp, he lost weight and muscle tone, and I honestly didn't think that he was going to make it. But it's been about two months, or maybe a month and a half now, probably more like two months. And he's got just a slight limp every now and then, but he's starting to put on the weight again, which is really exciting. So again, it just goes to show you how resilient these animals are. And we don't know what happened to him, but his foot almost looked like it was a little bit clubbed, so it was quite swollen. He could have had an abscess or something in between his hooves. Or maybe got a thorn or something and it got infected, who knows. Or perhaps a close encounter with a leopard. There are plenty of them around here. And maybe once this warthog is finished and the elephants move off, it will also have a chance to wallow. Here we are, and I have Daga Boys, or the Mad Boys, um, a.k.a., um, you know, Buffalo, or, you know, a.k.a., you know, Daga Boys, either way. These are Buffalo Bulls, and looks like they're doing very much the same, they're like the giraffe I showed you previously. Fully grown, beautiful horns, look at those. The middle of the horns is called the boss and that's as hard as metal. Yeah, all that is small compressed hairs called keratin and it has formed those horns. On the inside they have bone. Yeah, wet noses means like, you know, they're very healthy. Yeah, and there is a good number of them here. I think about six or seven. Yeah, this is a bachelor hard, which usually consist of only males and they reach maturity and start you know having this behavior at the age of about six seven main reason is they become too big and slow Tracy thank you for your question um, if I may ask for it to be repeated I asked migration I had only migration yes please if we have time oh Tracy uh, thank you I got the question now do they will be migrate with the the buffalo migrate with the migration no they don't they are residents uh, they have enough, you know, to graze here, so they don't need to migrate. And their numbers haven't exploded. And also, I'd say they're too heavy. They don't migrate. You can tell that they have different kind of horns, very much like us. Some people have very healthy, long hair. Some people from day one have got very scruffy, short hair. Some people, you know, at certain age, it stops growing. So very much like that, their horns are like that, you know, they start growing. I've seen some grow so long and then fall just a little bit towards the end. Mind you, this is one of dangerous animal. Yeah, can give you a run for your money. You don't want to be walking in these plains. Yeah, they catch top speeds of 60 kilometers now and they have endurance. They can turn at very sharp angles. So you don't want to mess around with these guys. Here they're all relaxed. Very few enemies, apart from a man with a gun. The second one is lion, but they do have to be in numbers, you know, lions to bring these guys down. If you go back in history, they were known to cause lots of harm to those people who went for them. They have been known to ambush people you know, in the wild. So when walking in the African bush, be careful because when they hear you, they will stop dead still and just wait. They are keen, they have keen sense of hearing. Their eyesight and their smell sens sensitivity is next to none. Very, very good. 
and the closed relatives to our domestic cows. You cannot believe this. The only difference between the two is these guys. Um, these, these guys these guys are very, very aggressive, and the young ones suckle from behind. Those are the only two differences between our domestic cattle and the buffalo. Yeah, they're making me lazy, so I'm gonna move on a little bit. Our owl looks like it's very lazy too. He's alert. He's looking around, even though it doesn't seem to be. Now they have a large upper eyelid, which is something they share with us that they don't share with other birds. And that brings us to our quiz answers. Now, the question was, of course, why their eyes can look so sleepy in the day. Are they asleep? But they're not. They're alert. They can actually see. And one of the answers that we got was from Dirt. Hi, Dirt. You say it's because they're nearsighted. It's not because of that. They can see very, very well. Those animals that are close and far away. It's because of how well they can see, especially in the dark, that they do this. And Mrs. Zero and Average are most closely correct. In fact, they are correct. To protect their eyes from the sun. Well done, both of you. It is, in fact, to protect their eyes from the sun. So their pupils cannot contract in the same way ours can. Our, can, our pupils can dilate and contract to tiny little pinholes when the sun is very bright to only let in the amount of light we need. But theirs cannot. So their pupils can't get small like ours to block light. theirs stay quite wide and in order to protect themselves from the sun and also the amount of light that enters the eye they kind of close their eyes but in fact they can still see through a little slit you'll find that most owls will look this way. And then as the sun starts to set, they'll open up their eyes and you'll see their beautiful larger pupils and those gorgeous irises. Well done, I'm impressed. Well, I'm going to move on and see what else we can find. Trish. Oh, thanks, Trish. Oh. Wonderful. We're with an elephant bull that is dust bathing and more disturbance being created here. They just love us. I'm just going to allow you to listen for a minute. There we go, disturbance. He's going to pick that up now, a big pile of it. You ready, Beaks? Yes. Throw it on his head. I know. He's good to 
definitely trying to get the roots. Turning the roots and the sticks through its mouth. The smaller sticks will actually be completely ingested. Much larger sticks will just have the, the outer bark layer removed before being spat out. You saw the elephant dung I showed earlier, there were those big sticks inside. They're not digested at all. Linmar, that's a very good question. I've always wondered that. Linmar wants to know why don't elephants sneeze when they dust bathe. You'd think they would, but I think that the, the cavity where the actual uh, itchiness or the sneezing part... People are hunting hippos unlike the normal big five that we know it's very true i would take that as a very good answer heidi and give you a 10 out of 10 and beverly you also say that uh, hippos are not predators which is true i mean hippos are herbivores and even i think they are hunted by you know lions or wild dogs i would agree with you too beverly and give another 10 out of 10 and say correctly that's not why they're in the list or in the pack of the big five if I'm asked one day, I would want to put uh, hippos to be the big six, if anything would change. Should we want to create a big six uh, of Africa, I would put the uh, hippos. But a small little gazelle here, we really see them. We haven't been seeing them of late as many as possible, or as we would like. And this is a Thompson gazelle. It's definitely a boy by looking at the size of his horns. Getting his territory would get because he is all alone in a radius I would see of what one kilometer square from where he is. Keep looking their tails as usual. Flies out. Predators just know I'm a lot. I'm here as much as I'm looking. And sometimes they spend so much time baying a lot or looking than eating. Good morning, sir. When you see the females, they usually have smaller horns or broken horns or horns that sometimes are not even existing. A good scratch there. And I'm wishing you, uh, Thompson Gazelle, a beautiful day. Thanks, Gigi, and a beautiful day to you too. We are still with our magnificent elephant bull, who is moving around the base of this very shrub-like tree. This is definitely a large or round leaf teak, and he's digging and digging and digging. The tree has got no chance, uh, and yet the tree will survive, everybody. You don't find many large round leaf teaks around because Elephants change the structure, as we spoke about before. There's wonderful scenes with the dust being kicked up. He's a magnificent bull. He's in his late 30s, even his 40s, I would say. Very relaxed and very hungry. See how deep his feet are in there, how much he's actually dug. He uses his feet not only to dig, but also to break the roots. So you'll see sometimes he'll turn his foot, he'll put it forward and then pull it backwards. And that's basically his heel trying to snap the root at the base. 
His trunk obviously isn't strong enough to break some of them. And if the roots were longer, he'd pull it out the ground and he'd pull it across his trunk, not his trunk, his tusk, and then snap it with the tusk. Hello, Nabil. You want to know why he's all alone and where's the herd? Well, actually, on our way through here, we probably found about seven or eight um, male elephants. And bulls are often on their own or in small groups of males. So uh, that's not concerning to see them on their own. But just across the way from where we are now, we, we were with those two or three before. We found a few more on the way here. So they're around. They're all spread out feeding. We're quite something to see when they all get together and go down to the water to drink. That will happen at some point. Especially with all that dust in his nose, can you imagine? spend a few more moments with our elephant as we watch him break the roots some more. Right, look at who has come down to visit us. The boys have been pushed on out and a breeding herd has finally made their way to the dam. Not a particularly big herd, but one that we see quite regularly. And we've been having some interesting interactions for the last two days. This herd and another herd actually sort of joined as one. And we're tolerating one another and feeding and drinking at the same time. But uh, that was uh, not long lived. They have split up and gone their separate ways again. But that little elephant in the middle there was quite funny a moment ago. We thought it was big and brave by standing out in the open, drinking by itself. And then I think quick, quickly realized that it's quite vulnerable and then ran in between uh, mom and probably an older sibling where well, it feels much happier. Come on, little one. I know that you want to make people laugh today and I know how much you're going to enjoy splashing around in the water. So why don't you go in for a swim? Something else that could be quite funny, which we'll watch out for, is with the impala and warthogs and animals coming down to drink too with the young elephants around. It could be quite chaotic. And uh, as you saw with Trish this morning, elephants chasing a buffalo bull around, we might have a similar thing, but just with other animals. Oh, this is the best thing in the world. Honestly, you can try and change my mind, but good luck. Elephants at a watering hole is, is one, of the one of my favorite things in the world, especially when they're young calves. And there are two little elephants in this herd all under, I would say, about six months. You can see there's the other one. It's a bit steep there. I don't think its trunk can quite reach the water. You can just see it's just splashing on the surface. Yes, little one, you gotta, you got to go down a bit further. you got to get your feet wet, I'm afraid. You can see it's not really putting much water into its mouth. It's splashed it all around. It is very funny. In trek, yeah, elephants actually do have rather large teeth. I suppose the biggest ones they have are growing out of the sides of their faces, but we always say that they don't use them like normal teeth. Um, those are essentially the incisors. Now, what are rather large are the molars of, of the elephants, which is situated inside the mouth. And I don't have a picture to show you, and I, I wish I had an elephant tooth to actually show you how big they are. Um, but they are quite wide, they're fairly long, and... Um, and they use those, and they've, well, they've got lots of grooves on the inside of them. They use that to grind up all, all the tough vegetation that they typically feed on. But, but yes, it is quite big. 
Seb, I have to draw your attention away from the elephants for one minute because my favorite warthog is also here and and his friend. Here's Linda. Linda the warthog. I know they've got ridiculous names, but you can't help but give them a pet name because they essentially I feel like they are my pets, but I can't touch them. I just have to look at them from a distance. It's one of the hardest things for being a safari guide. Like, it's all fun and, and we make it look very glamorous. But let me tell you how hard it is to not be able to have a domesticated pet, to have a cat or a dog like you normally would at home. You know, just to give you that unconditional love when you need it. I get it from watching the warthogs that come into camp and eat around my tent all the time. And we've seen one of my favorites earlier. And now we've got the other two. Um that um that are also in camp i can see them all sussing out where they're going to drink where can they drink water that they won't be chased you see that male in the front how he's erecting his mane normally they do things like that when they're trying to make themselves look bigger i think right now they're just like oh mm, not so sure about this there we go a nice little corner with no elephants for now where they can have a drink and probably pop their bottoms into the mud too and roll themselves around. Oh, I love seeing warthogs also when they're so happy and, and are in the mud. Oh, a little spur file of sorts too. A little Natal spur file coming down to have a drink. Off you go. Yes, you're safer with the warthogs than with the elephants. So everything is coming down. You have birds, there'll be insects that we can't see. I can't imagine how many wasps and bees and flies and all sorts of things are there. Yeah, you found a nice little puddle, a puddle, probably the elephants standing there and like sort of created a little well of water. Don't think it would be too tasty. I wouldn't drink that water, but you know, they don't really have a choice. So she's very easy to identify. I'm sure you've noticed that most of her left ear is missing. I'm not sure what would have happened. Are you hard of hearing now? No, probably not. I'm sure she can hear just fine. Oh, they're so fantastic. Ah, Sebastian, now we've got some wallowing action, which is great. I think that they're going to find, yes, there we go. Oh, look at that slushy mud. That's exactly what they're after. Knee deep now. Oh, next thing they'll do is probably literally just plop themselves down in, into it. Bellies first. There we go. Oh, no, this time bottom first. Ah, oh, isn't that just so nice? A little jacuzzi. Perfect. I think the weight of the elephants and the size of their footprints kind of creates the perfect little wallowing space for warthogs. And that's how a wallow starts. It's a, it's a large mammal like a, a hippo or a rhinoceros or an elephant marching through an area that's fairly wet. And then having things like warthogs come through and, and wallow in those footprints and make them wider. And, well, eventually it just gets more and more and more animals start to, to go into it. And then you create these spots. Oh, yes, you're very happy now. And I'm sure you can hear the splashing in the distance. That's, of course, not from the warthogs. But the whole herd of elephants is racing to that same spot that we saw the elephant bulls. <laughs> Look at that little one on the left. It didn't even waste any time. You're not even in the wallow yet. Go a bit further forward. You're just rolling around on dry sand. That's not how it's done. Well, there's a little bit of mud there. I suppose that's actually a bit better to stay on the outskirts because if it gets stuck in the middle, it's going to be a bit problematic. Oh, that was quite sweet. No, Mum's not going to tolerate you wanting to have a suckle, I'm afraid. Wrong time. I feel like older elephant calves never time when they want to have a drink of milk very well. They always do it when mum's either drinking water or trying to feed or, or having a mud wallow. And then, of course, they don't want to have anything to do with them. How many elephants can you fit in the mud? Quite a few, apparently. There's the little ones. I like playing spot the little ones through the legs of the adults. That one decided, nah, not yet. I'll wait till some others come out. I'll just have a drink and then I can have it all to myself. Seb, what do you think the chances of these warthogs having a scratch? So I know we're jumping from animal to animal, but this is another funny thing to watch. Look at this. And we're so close too. So here is our two warthogs. And obviously after a wallow, you've got to have a scratch. Look at that. That's a perfect stick. Yes. Rub, rub, rub. 
Oh, that's so cool. I love it that they're so relaxed with us. This is my favorite thing, is just seeing animals carrying about their day with us only being a few meters away from them and not worrying at all. I feel like that's that's what all safari guides are after. <laughs> little, little scratch of the bottom there. Oh, you're done. That wasn't a very long scratch. A young male now also having his chance. Oh, climbing straight over to make sure you get the belly. That's a very important part. You can't forget all the ticks and things that get stuck under there. Yeah, we're watching you. Wave. I don't know. I don't think you can wave. Blink twice. <laughs> Uh, anyways, that's it for the warthogs, and now they are going to head into camp and see if there's anything tasty to eat. Uh, welcome back. I'm now at a river, and over here I found my friends now. I don't know if they recognize me now. It's been almost more than 10 days coming here uh, i don't know if they do but um, yeah now i'm back here the residents of this river the hippos are here and i can see they have two tiny little ones you see them over there they are really playing i hope they can play again looks like they're playing hide and seek underwater yeah i don't know if they're gonna do that uh, they were really jumping yeah these are very young I would give them that one to the left, maybe a month. And the other one was much, much smaller. Look at him or her. Yeah, I would say, you know, just a couple of weeks, maybe two weeks. Really, really small. Yeah, looks like a healthy part of this one. It is. Looked like the one to the left really wanted to get out of water, but something spooked him. He looked very alert. Then slowly, you know, you saw that, you know, got back into water. But he needs, or she needs, the confidence of a female to come out and head towards the bank. And then maybe she might follow. It is typical for them to be wary at that age because they can be a snack for lion. Um, lucky enough, there's no crocodile there. So lion would be the one mostly to go for them. It is the only enemy to these guys when they are out of water. In water, every now and then, it's the crocodile, but very, very rarely, because over the years, they have a mutual, they have a mutual, you know, respect, because the hippo is quite dangerous and can, you know, injure or kill the crocodile. This is the beginning of the river stake. Hopefully I can show, share some exciting moments when they turn up. Honestly, crocodiles are phenomenal predators. They, they really, really do sit, I think, right up top of the um, predator chart. I mean, I've even seen it in Zambia where a crocodile has tried to go for an elephant before and grabbed its tail. And there are multiple videos on the interweb of crocodiles grabbing elephants' trunks. And I mean, that's bold. That's really bold. But luckily, these elephants don't have to worry about that because they are safely just in the mud enjoying themselves. Be careful, little one. You're going to get stuck if you go in too deep on its knees now. I don't even know what it is trying to do, which part of its body it's trying to cover in mud. <laughs> and, you know, when the elephants are in there, I mean, if you think about it, they're not really worried about one another. They're kind of just trying to cover themselves in mud. But it always amazes me how very rarely a little elephant in a situation like this will get knocked off of its feet. I mean, that'll be detrimental to whoever knocks a little elephant over. They'll get, find themselves in quite a, a bit of trouble from the the older cows. You don't even know what to do with yourself, do you, little elephant? You're slipping and sliding, and your trunk is going everywhere, and thankfully you have your face to land on. 
Oh, but if they do find themselves in a bit of trouble, they've got all those adults that will help them and come to their rescue. And if they need to be almost lifted out or pushed out of the mud, you might find when mom comes out now and little one struggles, she'll turn back and she'll offer her trunk and assistance. But I think it'll be okay. It doesn't seem to be too deep, so no need to worry. You might also hear some wood chopping going on in the background. Goodness gracious, today is going to be a busy day at this watering hole. I don't think it's going to stop. I think there's just going to be animal after animal after animal. I suspect that the other breeding herds will make their way down, and I have a, hmm, a suspicion that even the tallest of tall creatures is going to arrive at the dam fairly soon. That's the giraffe I'm talking about, because there's been loads of them around too. I'm very sorry, I did not hear that question. Could I please have it again? Oh, it was not a question. <laughs> the giraffe are actually coming in, they're just behind us, so I'm going to give them a bit of room to let them come down and drink. Very good. Uh, tell us still right then uh, what again, as you have always known, a lot could happen. She might even see what coming for a drink. We've got more zebras here and a small little Thompson Nazal that was hiding. And to the left, we've got a pig. And if you notice carefully, they've got different eating habits here. I'm talking of the warthogs. I think it's a family of three. Very popular with the leopards. If you look carefully, the one close to your screen, she seems to be eating with the front legs bent, or rather both of them seems to be eating with their legs bent. And there've always been a debate, why do they eat that way? You see that? Then legs up for the one running now. But the one sitting in the middle that's still feeding got the legs bent. And I've always wondered why do they feed like that? And a few theories have come up. Uh, either they got very short necks or they got their heads glued to their body. And for that reason, uh, for them to reach the grass, they need either to bend that way to reach the grass. But also there have been another uh, school of thought where we think they need to have some leverage so that when they keep scooping the grass, they have enough energy to uproot as much tubers if that's what they're eating as possible. If not doing that, then they, they got some weak uh, uh, muscles that cannot uproot much food or much tubers or roots of grass. Small little families, they go out together. It's quite an issue to see one alone. Could be twos, threes, fives. And when you see the piglets, when they're young, it's always fun to see them run. Beautiful Masimara with the oil escapement in the background there. When you come to the Mara, we got so many, uh, I would say so many habitats. What you're seeing there at the, at the end of your screen, in the background, that is the Ololol escarpment. And when you talk of the habitats of the Mara, you know, we have the savanna, we have hills, we have river lines, we have cliffs, and there's a lot that we can learn about the geography of the Masi Mara. Africa's unique and stunning ecosystem has been formed over countless eons. The Masai Mara lies in the fertile space between the Great Rift and Western Valleys. Violent tectonic upheaval and volcanic deposits have created a fertile paradise. The soils support nutritious grasslands and savanna, which nourishes an abundance of animals. The highlight of the year is the arrival of the great wildebeest migration. Some 1.5 million of these antelope make their way to the Mara each year. They risk the crocodiles lurking in the river to reach the rich red oat grass on the other side. 
Juma in South Africa's Greater Kruger is even more ancient than the Mara. Its sandy soil support a variety of woodland habitats, made famous by one of the most elusive of cats, the leopard. Its thickets and clearings are also home to Africa's smaller creatures. Each plays a valuable role in this magical South African ecosystem. The colors, textures, smells and sounds of the Mara and Greater Kruger are equally beautiful but exquisitely unique. Welcome back live to the woodlands of Juma, everybody. And I'm sure you could see by those short clips the stark difference between the Maasai Mara landscape and these wooded areas of the Sabi Sands, where our underlying geology here is granite and it leads to very sandy soils. We don't have the same volcanic activity that pushed enormous amounts of volcanic ash over the landscape, like the Mara, which forms very deep, rich, thick black cotton soils. So very, very water holding and also very unfriendly to trees because the thick black cotton soil, when it gets wet, shrinks and swells, shrinks and swells and actually destroys roots. So very specific trees occur there. Whereas here we don't have the same clay, we don't have the same um, basaltic soils. There are basalts around, but normally you find them in the low-lying areas where they've actually been washed down. And if you dig deep enough into a termite mound like this, you'd probably find some of it. Some of the clay that's brought from the bottom to the top. But for the most part, the soils, especially where we sit right now, are very sandy and very coarse, which means lots of moisture runs through them. So these high upland areas are characterized by very broad-leafed trees, able to suck the water up from quite deep in the water table. characters that I haven't told you about just yet. It is the three pigs that sadly have lost their mum. Now, we've been seeing them for a couple of weeks, which has been awesome, and I even know which burrow that they're in, but I'm very surprised to see that they did this far in life on their own. No, elephant, don't be mean, they're being chased away. Hopefully they'll just go back round and, and come and have a drink again. We did see them, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and they were actually in their burrows very early in the afternoon. Normally they'll stay out just as the sun is setting and then head on home and into a burrow, normally in a termite mound. But this lot at about 4, between 4.30 and 5 p.m., they were like, nah, we're done for the day. We've eaten, we've drank, we're going to go to sleep. So it's it really, really is crazy that they're still alive, especially with a lone lioness that's been hanging around. Um, these three would make a much easier target um, and probably be a bit more successful in catching because they're just very inexperienced at life. But they're the bossy bulls that will just push and shove anybody and everybody that comes anywhere close to them. I'm quite curious to see what happens when the the giraffe eventually make their way around. So what they've done is, I'm just going to tell you this while we watch the elephants, is that they walk behind the vehicle. They didn't want to come down and drink from the side. So now they've gotten behind the dam. And I think that they should come all the way around and pop out behind where those elephants are. But um, it might take them some time because there's plenty of tempting trees that they will pass. Uh, but I'm sure they'd want to nibble on. But there they are. No swimming yet. I'm shocked. I thought we would have had multiple swimming animals by now. I I'm almost certain that it's going to be an elephant bull that decides to take the plunge first. We'll just have to be patient and, uh, and wait and see. Can you also hear all the birds? There's so many quelias around at the moment. 
lots and lots of them, that all those birds that were making a noise, now they've gone quiet. They will also be coming down to the water's edge. It's actually quite a beautiful sound. I don't know if we'll be able to see any of the quelias. I'm afraid they're so small and they're sitting just a little bit too far away. Little pigs, are you going to have a wallow too? I actually haven't seen them wallowing. Ah, look at what Sebastian has just spotted. <laughs> it's the terrapins. <laughs> look at that enormous one on the left and then the other smaller ones. So I always joke and I like to describe these as water tortoises for anybody that doesn't know what a terrapin is. But essentially it's not a tortoise nor is it a turtle. It is something in between. So it predominantly lives in water, but they do come out onto land and can travel you know, fairly long distances, but they need to stay nice and moist. Sometimes they'll even bury themselves in mud if there isn't any pools of water around. Um, but now they're just catching the rays of the sun and warming up as um, ectothermic animals need to do. So they, they unfortunately can't control their body temperatures. They need to obtain heat from an external source and today it's the sun sometimes it can also be a body temperature from another animal it can be a number of different things but they live in the water too and sometimes you just see the heads sticking out little snorkels and they eat lots of different things they do have water leaping up are known to remove parasites straight off the oh, sorry. Seb, so can we see if we can see some of the quelias? So, do you see there's a small... Let me see if I can point to it. They keep landing there. So they're in the trees above it, but when they come down to drink, they kind of land... Where's my finger? There. So that's where they're landing, but I think that they're sitting up top there. So for a small little bird, there they are in the tree. Ah, that's all of them. So look how tiny those little birds are. And it looks like some of the males are actually coming into breeding season at the moment. They're getting their nice plumage. But um, they won't necessarily always line up on the water's edge to have a drink. They might, you know, use a, a shrub that has fallen in the water uh, to drink. And that's kind of what they're doing. So those are all those birds that were making a noise. There they go. And these are those birds that gathering huge flocks of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions and form those beautiful murmurations. That is just a small glimpse of what they can do. Oh, sorry everybody, you're not going anywhere. You're still staying with me. But I'm sure you saw those quelias flying around, red-billed quelias. They're beautiful birds. Really, really lovely. Oh, look, they actually are. See, they won't stay at the water for too long. Go down, have a quick drink, and then land on a shrub where they can hide away. So out there, they're very exposed. And normally what you'll find is you'll find small raptors, so things like lizard buzzards and um, goshawks and, and a variety of other um, raptors sitting up in trees near water waiting for this perfect moment where they can ambush them. There might be a bunch of other birds that will also join them as they drink water. So you might find some blue waxbills, maybe even green-winged pytilias. Um, I'm sure a fair few firefinch species will all come down and they'll, uh, you know, gather together. But it's quite something, even just in the small flock, as they all fly down together, quickly get a beak full of water and then disappear back. Talk about being nervous. I don't blame them though. I really don't. In terms of predators in the water, not really many. Not, well, not at this watering hole. <laughs> Fairy, yes, I have to agree. It is uh, like watching a, an ocean wave sort of slowly come on in and then gently push up onto the shores of the beach. It's very, very therapeutic. So we've had we've had a lot of therapy today in terms of the elephants, watching the warthogs, and then now the birds. Here we go. The elephants are getting deeper into the water, so I wonder if this means we're going to have some swimming elephants. Oh no, that one is going to go face first into the mud. 
It's always more spectacular when you see like a really big elephant bull having a wallow because you think to yourself, I don't know, I think to myself, I shouldn't generalize, how on earth are they so nimble? Because it's a big animal. And they move around there like they weigh absolutely nothing. Are you stuck now, elephant? Oh, I love those sounds. I actually really do enjoy the sounds of the quilias. Oh, a bit of a head shake. I'm not sure what for. So it sounds like the audio of all the animals is quite good at the moment. So I'm going to stop speaking for a little bit and I'm sure you'll all be quite happy for What a perfect moment, eh? I'm very, very privileged to be able to sit outside this dam every single day and witness all the different animals coming down. I wouldn't change it for, a world, for the world. I would not like to be in an office, that's for sure. So no swimming elephants Fingers crossed that some will come down and brave the m muddy waters. But until then, it seems like it's just going to be the impalas racing on in. Yeah, we're still back here. And our hippos looks like they're taking a little bit of their time today to come out, which they're very much allowed because... I don't speak hippo language and they will, you know, get me if I try to tell them anything. Looks like the sun is either harsher today because at this time yesterday and previous day, they were already on the beach out on the other side, sunning themselves, but today they are still in. Remember, this is a live coverage. We're coming from the Masai Mara and uh, over where i am it, i would appreciate a lot of comments and questions you can pass them through hashtag um, cgtn wild or uh, hashtag wild earth that's where you can pass them to me and i'll really appreciate any comments yeah i don't know what happened there yeah that is the hippo language I don't know if you heard that. Something about these hippos is that there are so many research and, uh, you know, researchers have said that during the day, the oxygen level is very low because they're all in the water with all their droppings. Naomi. You ask if hippos mate on land or in water. Good question. And they mate in the water, surprisingly. They do mate in the water. It's a rather elaborate affair. I hope I will one day, uh, you know, share it with you rather than explaining. But do they do mate in the water. And usually during mating, a male and a female will separate and just form a honeymoon corner where they'll stick by themselves. Usually there is a lot of hissing going on. Um, and, you know, that's, how, that's the noise they make during mating. And once it's done, it will last a day or two. That's, they go back and join the rest of the pod. Yes, looks like our little guys are wanting to come out and there is an ox pecker that's really, really you know, waiting for them to come out so that it can peck on either maybe ticks they have, open wounds, 
I don't know if you can see it. Oh, so it looks like an, um, a sandpiper, not an oxpecker, uh, with its wagging tail, a bobbing, we call it. Looks like a sandpiper. I can't get really close up a look of it, but I'll be telling you what it is when you come back. Good. Isaac, let us know about budding. And I can tell you, when we look at people who know their buds, Isaac is very good in bud. Personally, I respect him both for being able to sometimes even help me identify buds that will always give me a small little challenge, especially the juveniles. Now, I moved a little bit, and we got this uh, elephant here that's feeding on the grass there. And the whole idea, it shows how elephants will change places uh, depending on what they are looking for. Elephants have a variety of food, you know, they'll be feeding on. There are times they go get some trees, there are times they get the backs of trees, there are times they get vegetations and they just approach the stems and the leaves and the twigs. But also, they also prefer the grass. It may look like dry grass, but they know what part to get because... They're very intelligent animals. So they, they pluck it out, they get the grass out of the soil, shake it, and get the right part. So you can see where we are with an open area is a classical savanna habitat and all the trees that you're seeing in the background are what we call the balanites. Sometimes we also call them the shepherd trees. And again in the background what you're seeing is the oral escarpment that we saw before when especially we were looking at the geography of the Mara. As it warms up, you'll see these ellies keeping flapping their ears. And my guess, this is like a lone bull. Nothing out of the ordinary to see uh, lone bulls on their, on their own. Just moving and maybe trying to catch up uh, with the other bulls and forming a herd. The grass looks quite dry, but still very healthy uh, for these elephants to keep eating. I get some very cool breeze. And I'm sure there is lots of water uh, not very far from where this elephant is feeding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we really have to thank you very much for all your questions uh, this morning, for all your great comments, and it was joy to have you. We'll see you tomorrow morning for CGTN Digital Safari. Many thanks and goodbye.